All right, very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Innovation Thursdays brought to you by IMDA Open Innovation Platform. My name is Ching Hong, the MC for today. So today we are going to have a very, very interesting hybrid event over here. We thank all guests for making a way all the way down to Pixel over here, the place where we create and we catalyze changes and we move forward this digitalization together with industry partners and individuals like yourself um, for our problem owners as well as problem solvers over here. So the event is about to begin in about five minutes time so we warmly welcome each and every one of us over here to, to take a seat so if you are going to be sharing some of our speakers later thank you so much for joining us um you get a seat at the front row right over here um at the reserve seats these are actually reserved for all the speakers so speakers or whoever's going to be talking you can take the front seats at the front two rows and the rest of our problem solvers we warmly welcome you as well thank you so much for making time all the way down here and we do hope that we make the best and the most out of your opportunity over here to ask as many questions as you have later on after the sharing. So the format of the sharing later on of the problem brief will be as such. Our speaker, our problem owner, will talk about the problem, the challenges, and certain um, possible use cases for their problems at hand. And they will then open up to a 10-minute Q&A for both our physically present participants as well as our participants on Zoom to actually raise any questions. Now, participants on Zoom, we warmly welcome you as well. We do hope that you can join us physically the next time. But in the meanwhile, also ask any questions that you have through Q&A, right? Do not ask that through, through the Zoom chat because we are unable to monitor the progress over there. We do hope that you can raise all questions via the Q&A. We're going to be starting in just like about in three minutes time. So please, uh, we invite everyone to take a seat as well. And of course, today, um, before we begin the program, I right? just like to warmly welcome our friends from the Monday Wildlife Group. Where are you? Hello. <laughs> Today is a Monday special, and um, for those of you who are, you probably can't see this, but it's a very interesting one. Uh, a group of people dressed in green in front, okay? They are all from the Monday Wildlife Group, all eager to share the different challenges that they have on hand. Uh, we're also very, very proud to invite some of our past champions, right? The problem solvers of some of Monday Wildlife Group's problems over here. So uh, as I read out their names, if they're present, we will invite you to raise your hand. We have the R&D manager of Delta Research Center, Yongjun. Yes, hi, Yongjun. Hi, let's give you a big round of applause as well, Yongjun. All right, so they are your clients now, I assume. <laughs> All right, next up, we also have the Chief Technology Officer of Ministry XR, Andrew. Hi, Andrew. And of course, we also have our enablers over here, none other than the Program Manager of Cloud Innovation Center, Amazon Web Services, Mr. Richard Go. Richard. Really, really proud to be in this event, and we shall be starting in just a very, very short while, I'm waiting for people to stream in. Um, we are all good to start in just a minute's time. So thank you very much for joining us. And of course, uh, uh, this is an afternoon where great minds will meet, and we will come up with different solutions. And of course, I'd just like to remind everybody who's taking part in this round of challenges in Court 13 for the Monday special, that the submission date is actually on 29th July, 4 p.m., to avoid any disappointment, please do not submit at 3.59 p.m. of 29th July, but instead try to submit a week later, uh, a week earlier, sorry, a week earlier or even more to avoid any disappointment and also to allow the, uh, you know, the staff members to peruse it a little bit more, give it some thought um, so that they can select the best proposal that fits the bill. And of course, over here, uh, we are at a wonderful space that we are going to go on to share a little bit more later. So we're all good to start on Zoom as well as li real life, right? So ladies and gentlemen, please give yourself a big round of applause for being here together with us. Thank you for coming to Innovation Thursdays. My name is Ching Hong, the MC for this afternoon. So we have been doing this virtually for quite a while, um, ever since COVID. I believe we used to do it in person as well, but without the streaming. So combining our wisdom that we got during COVID as well as the in-person participation, we are here with the hybrid event, with the center camera uh, being the stream machine for our Zoom participants who will be joining us virtually in spirit as well. So we're very proud to bring you over here to the space we call Pixel. Now, for those of you on Zoom, please 
do join us the next time because this is a wonderful collaboration space, incubation and innovation space for startups and corporates to ideate and to build all these customer-centric digital products. And we are located in the One North Innovation District. So over here later for our participants, you'll get a tour of the facilities, which includes over 28,000 square feet of innovation space, including labs for VR, AR, 5G enabled labs. I just got a tour earlier and we have incubation office. It's all well positioned to support problem solvers as well. So problem solvers have a good look later and see how you can utilize these different resources. So since 2018, OIP has posed over 300 challenges with a combined price money pool of over $8.5 million. Now, that has attracted over 11,000 tech solvers. So they've come in with all their innovative solutions, including um, our partners at the front as well. So thank you so much for taking part in this challenge and thank you for doing what we do to move things forward as well. Now, it is... We are currently at Innovation Corp 13, where we have 16 challenges amounting to total more than $500,000. That's more than half a million of price monies for winning tech solvers. So we have different industries taking part for Corp 13. We have people in professional services, we have people in aviation, engineering, and education. But today, we have the most unique industry joining us, and they are from the Mandai Wildlife Group. So if you have ever heard of Amin, right? If you have ever Ever gone to the you know the river wonders to see Lola, then you're probably familiar uh, with their exhibits and their work as well. But the question really is what goes on behind the scene to present these beautiful sites to you, to present these beautiful experiences, and how can we further enhance it using digital capabilities? And that is exactly the question that we're going to raise today with our problem owners and look for solutions from our problem solvers. So once again, I think it's very, very important to stress this that every challenge is worth up to 50000 dollars in award and to submit proposals by 29 July. So today, we shall bring on the challenges very, very soon. Once again, for our tech solvers, our problem solvers on Zoom, feel free to ask the questions anytime on Q&A. I'll try to address them live together with our problem owners later. Now, as this is a Monday special, we're first going to kick off with an opening sharing, a welcome sharing by Atmos and Ryan from the Monday Wildlife Group. Please give them a huge round of applause. Atmos and Ryan. Right. Hello, everyone. A very, very good afternoon. Welcome to Innovation Thursday. And it's really, really excited and exciting uh, to be here today in person. And of course, uh, like Ching Hong has mentioned, a hybrid session. So we have actually conducted together uh, with IMDA uh, on various uh, Innovation Thursday previously for our previous challenge. Uh, but those were all online. So very, very happy to be here in person uh, with you. And for me, especially uh, to be back at the launch pad area, yeah, where I spent my last uh, seven or eight years time uh, over here in a startup ecosystem. So uh, very happy to be here uh, today. Uh, I'm Amos New again, uh, and I head up the Transformation Office. Today with me, uh, I have my team from Transformation Office Innovation Lab. Uh, you guys can wait, yeah. Yeah, and also our life science colleague uh, who are here with us today to share with you more in depth on all the different interesting challenges and problems that we'd like you to help us solve, right? Yeah, but of course, uh, before I go on, I would like to thank and express our heartfelt thanks to IMDA team, Pixel Lab team in uh, supporting us in this innovation uh, journey has been a great partner uh, to be working with you. Thank you very much. And of course, to AWS uh, for the support for this particular program and working with us in uh, later on providing mentorships and platforms uh, for the solvers. So thank you very much uh, for this collaboration. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I'm sure, right, uh, Mandai Wildlife Group should not be something that is foreign to you or at the very least, you know, about the Singapore Zoo, right? So um, we are actually embarking on um, a transformation of Mandai Precinct Rejuvenation Project. So if you happen to come by the zoo recently, you will see a lot of uh, construction and development going on, right? Apart from expanding and uh, the, the park itself, uh, we are moving the bird park over, which will become a bird paradise. And we are building you know, two more indoor attractions and two new rain forest park and eco hotel. So, in line with all these constructions that are 
ongoing and going to be a new point of interest uh, for Singapore. Um, there are also a lot of technology development that uh, are ongoing, right? So some of them, we have caught them uh, based on the larger IT uh, implementation projects. But at the same time, we are embarking on our open innovation journey. And there are two key uh, purposes to that. Right. One is really to look at how we might be able to use emerging technology to solve some of our um, innovation challenges or some of the things that we say internally, be it improving the way that we work in helping us to scale our operations when our park, new parks open, right? Yeah, but also as a step towards connecting Mandai to the wider, a wider ecosystem outside here, right? With our startup ecosystem, your solvers, with our partners, and create an exciting community in working together in a space of contributing to animal care, biodiversity, and conservation innovation areas. So this is something that uh, we are also very excited in, you know, uh, in working with you uh, to see how we can build an ecosystem of solvers and innovators and to ideate new areas that we can work together. Yeah, so that's whole purpose uh, of Mandai Open Innovation Labs is kind of like, you know, trying to reach out and also allow you to be plugged into our ecosystem. Right, so um, during the last two rounds of uh, innovation challenges, we kind of like publish uh, one or two problem statement uh, at a time. And um, that please that we have some winners of our past challenges uh, coming here to share with you our exp uh, their experience in working with us. And actually it's a core learning journey, right? For us to also understand how to work with startups and innovators and to grow together and to see how then, you know, we might be able to deploy the solution for the part-wide operations and to scale out the deployment. But for this particular innovation challenge, is very unique, right? Because through the one whole year of learning, we find that actually there's a lot more that we can bring to the teams here, right? Apart from, you know, using our solutions, we believe that our experts and expertise and domain knowledge, especially from our life science team and our, our operation team and things like that, will be able to add a lot of value uh, to you in understanding the sustainability and conservation area. And who knows, right? You might be able to establish wider business values in this area and reach out to more customers in this space, right? By working with us. So, we have grouped together this round, three problem statements and put them together as a program. So apart from just working with us on solving the problem statement and uh, come up with a solution, we are also putting in additional things like mentorship, networking and so on, and together with partners like ATVS coming in. Right. So um, this is going to be a six month co innovation program. There's a small token. If you win it, right, you're selected, you'll get $50,000 from us. But I believe that you use AWS platform, they'll be able to give you some credits as well. Yeah. But the value that you will derive out of this program will be a lot more than 50,000, right? Because IMDA will also be coming in to provide you with guidance and pitch training and things like that. You'll be able to tap into the ecosystem of partners and uh, other collaborators and potential customers as well beyond just Mandai, right? So for this co innovation programs, we work with you over the six month period you will be able to gain insights into the exciting tourism industry, park operations, um, kind of uh, industry, access to our global networks of opportunities. So actually for Mandai, we also work with other zoos around the region and globally. And sometimes we will also share with them our best practices and knowledge and solutions that we use. So there's a potential that, you know, by working with us, you will be able to expand into this need in this network itself. You'll be able to engage directly with our Mandai Wildlife Group business teams that can help you to frame your start work value proposition. Yeah, so internally, we are also doing quite a lot of new product development. We are also learning. We are also doing certain venture building um, work. And our team in the emerging products and the mentors will be able to help you with you know, ideating your new business model if there's you know new business model to come out from it. So we're putting in mentorship work with you to identify the key value proposition 
Um, our life science team, right, is one of the most well-known team, right, in terms of the uh, life science in this region. Um, they will be able to share with you, right, uh, more insights about the domain and you'll be able to learn from it. In fact, I'm also learning a lot myself as I work with them on these uh, projects. You'll be able to access to Mandai ecosystem, networking opportunities in the industry and being part of our rejuvenation project. You'll hear insights from our tech vendors who participated in our OIP uh, challenges. Yeah? And uh, also, you'll be able to join us in our innovation festival, our participation in the Singapore Week of uh, Technology and Innovation Switch, right, uh, to showcase our solution together with us. And then at the end of the day, we will organize a demo day for you together uh, during our Mandai Innovation Festival. So it's going to be an exciting journey for you to plug into this entire new ecosystem. If you are interested, not just about just solving the problem, but creating or access to a new market. Right? So this is something that we hope will add value to your journey in co-innovating with us. Okay, so uh, this challenge, there are a few key themes, uh, animal care, guest engagement, experience engagement, uh, covering the areas of biodiversity, conservation, and smart attraction management. Uh, you might be able to also talk to our sustainability colleagues um, through this uh, particular program. So the price money is 50K and uh, submit your proposal by the 29th of July. And guess what? We're going to organize a pitch session for you uh, after that, right? That will happen in a zoo itself. So you'll come to the Singapore Zoo and we'll organize that pitch session uh, for you before you get into the program. Yeah, so that's from me. And uh, let me hand over to my colleague, Ryan, to share with you more details of the program. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you. Hey, hi, good afternoon. How's everyone? Okay, right. Okay, I'll go, I'll go. Okay, so I will be sharing with you um, a number of agendas. Um, and later I'll hand over to the life science team and also uh, the transformation team on the on sharing on the all the problem statements or the challenge. Um, so a quick background, we have started this since June 2021, a uh, total of four challenges uh, and it was spread across various social medias and to date we have received about 59 proposals and about 200k price uh, being given uh, for these four challenges. Okay, at the end, you might forget uh, some of the things that we mentioned, but this, you have to keep in mind, uh, you can take photos and things like that. So, uh, how it works uh, is that on the 14th of July, we will be getting all this, uh, if you're interested in understanding more in depth about what these three problem statements are, we will be having this on-site visit. Uh, we will be also giving, uh, sending NDA. So, if you are interested, uh, send back to us before you can go to the on-site visit because we will be bringing you to the back of house it's not exclusion uh, but it's really for because of the pro of the, uh, of the project okay so i will be sending you so you just uh send to us by 12th of july uh and on on-site visit it will be from 10 to 12 so no no after you understand the in-depth in context about the back of house and things like that uh closing of submissions uh which Xing Long, uh Ching Long has mentioned 29th of july close of uh this problem statements or challenge uh, submissions uh Subsequently, before 16th of August, we'll be announcing the shortlisted proposals, which you will be proceeding to phase B uh, as per IMDA uh, usual process. Uh, then we'll have this face-to-face -face presentation. It will be face-to-face, -face, uh, but in virtual. Uh, this enables uh, Mandai to ask questions, uh, you know, in depth and give you some, provide some insights or, or feedback along the way. Uh, subsequently, you all, will can, you all can go back maybe go and fine tune the proposal a bit and we'll announce the top three selected proposal which this top three uh, challenge statements are so there are three challenge statements total about nine uh, three entries, nine, nine line. so nine nine tax solvers. Uh, we will be inviting you to the pitch training. Uh, it will be done by uh, with together with uh, MDA, and there will be uh, AWS supporting and giving some guidance also along the way on using the credits and uh, so and so forth. Uh, and on the twenty fifth of August, there will be a pitch day that MS has mentioned. It will be at Forest Lodge, Singapore Zoo. There will be a joint press release and so and so forth, where you will be there to do the so called the demo. 
more day kind of uh, you know sharing and presentation. Then we will award the final winner to onboard the journey. Okay, Claire. Uh, so this is how the, the the show or the rundown of the the series of items. Any questions at this point of time? No. Okay. So I'll hand over to the life science team. So to note, there are total three problem problem challenges. Uh, we will start with two first from animal in layman terms all animal related uh, items. Then the last one, the last problem statement will be uh, for uh, related to the guest experience, which is the Mandai uh, tag that we have mentioned before. So I hand over to Cecilia to share with you more in, in depth about this uh, two challenge statements. Over to Cecilia. Hey, a very good afternoon to everyone. Thanks, Ryan, for handing over. So my name is Cecilia. I'm an assistant curator with the animal care department under the life sciences team in Mandai Wildlife Group. So the very first question. Okay, the very first question. Welcome to Mandai first, right? So who is Mandai. So basically, Mandai, you'll be very familiar with Singapore Zoo, Night Safari, River Wonders, Jurong Bird Park. And we are all a family together. We are the Mandai Wildlife Group. So under these four parks, we welcome over 4.6 million visitors a year, basically. And actually, positive animal welfare is key. It is one of the most important things to all of us. So our purpose for our Mandai Wildlife Group is basically to provide meaningful and memorable wildlife experiences for our guests, for our visitors. And in doing so we hope to actually inspire them to value and conserve wildlife and biodiversity. So every visit to our park, it comes with conservation included. So the next question, why are all of you here? As mentioned earlier, Positive animal welfare is very important to Mandai Wildlife Group or NWG for short. So we are very, very excited to leverage on your expertise, your digital knowledge to help us to enhance our animal welfare in caring for our animals and at the same time to optimize our staff productivity because happy staff means happy animals. So we are very confident you can help us with that. Okay. So to share a little bit of background or a glimpse to how the animal care of life is like for all of us, for our keepers and for our animal care staff. So behavioral diversity is one of the key things in the indicating of animal welfare. But what do we really mean by behavioral diversity? So generally, we will explain a little bit more on the behavioral diversity part and enrichment. So don't worry if it's a very new term that you haven't come across. But all you need to know is across a lot of literature and research studies, it has shown that through enrichment activities, we have increase like animal activity and the behavior of our collection animals and this is something that we want for our animal because it's a positive indicator for welfare so more on the behavior diversity part what do we really mean by behavior diversity it means we want to provide a stage and environment that encourages our animals to explore to actually have as much behaviors as they can in the wild. And this is ultimately the goal for us that we want to encourage them to be more exploratory in nature, to be able to have activity within the habitat itself, such as um, running around, allo grooming means um, grooming of their con specifics, which is their fellow animals, if let's say it's a social species. And of course, we want them to engage, play, explore the habitat, to actually be excited about this habitat that they're actually in. Some of the undesirable behavior may include, for example, we don't want them to be too bored, like to rest for too long or to lie down. Of course, it is still important and we always give them a choice. But in doing so, we want to maximize the options for them and to increase as much behaviors as they can express when they are in the wild in our habitat for them as well. And stereotypic pacing, we will touch on a little bit more because it's one of the challenge in our animal care site when we want to prevent or minimize that from happening, okay? So all these are very technical. I'm just grouping in green and red, like basically to show you what are some of the behaviors we would like to increase or encourage uh, in this challenge that we throw to you. 
All right. So first, the concept of enrichment. What do we mean by enrichment or what do you understand by enrichment? It's basically how we spice things up for our animals. And this can actually include habitat refurbishment. So habitat refurbishment means, for example, new locks, new branches, new placement. So the keepers will actually bring in all the different locks from outside, from the branches, and we actually do a refurbishment in the habitat itself, like placement of the locks, like increasing vines, things like this. This locks or like this vines for, artificial, uh, for the artificial design vine that we actually include for arboreal animals. Arboreal animals are animals that actually travel more on the top part of the canopy. And certain times, we will provide some treats. Of course, this means noble food, but we will clear with our nutrition department colleagues and ensure that they are good for our animals before we give them. Puzzle feeders, activity devices, these are the key things that you may want to focus on and consider a bit more for this challenge. In this regard, it could be something like setting up of things like this. This is our otter, our Asian small cloud otter, and this is a semi-aquatic species. So for example, it will spend time in the water, it will also spend time on land. And this ball that you see here, it's actually a sipatakwa ball, and inside we actually put some noble food items inside. So actually, we will actually encourage the animal to try and think of ways to get the item out. Instead of we just presenting the food itself, we vary the way to engage them and to provide them with something to think about and to do, okay? So these are mainly the enrichment and the puzzle feathers or even the activity device concept that we are looking at. Positive reinforcement training is where our animal care staff spend time with the animals to actually train them, to actually train them mainly for, like for example, veterinarian procedures. If we need to bring them for a health check, how not to stress them. If we need to take some blood tests to check their health status, some of them trust us eventually to actually do so with the assistant, uh, with the assistant of the vets and for us to actually take the blood draw from them without being scared because we spend enough time to desensitize them and all these are part of positive reinforcement enforcement training for our animals. Okay, a lot of other studies, um, maybe I'll just pull out two for your reference. So if you look at this, this is one of the studies that was done on olfactory uh, stimulation or enrichment for the ocelot, which is a small cat species. And you actually see that olfactory-wise, they compare between, let's say, the wild animal and a uh, animal under ca uh, captivity, which is under human care. Feeding enrichment is always something that is easiest to elicit interest in our animals in the collection. And also they test out different things. Olfactory wise, usually the response will be a bit little lesser. So in this issue of this challenge, we would like to think about visual olfactory or even sound cues. How do we actually engage them and to elicit a response or interest from the animals? So one of the other zoos in Zurich, uh, they actually did up this enrichment feed box for the lemurs. So lemurs is a primate species, right? And they noticed that because of these enrichment boxes that they put in the habitat itself, there were more activity. The animal is curious, they explore, and basically they engage more with the with the canopy level and the visitors are visitors able to see them better in activity. And also in a way, they feel very engaged by the animals. So it's a win-win situation if we can get this right. So in summary, what do we want for our animals? Good health, good food, good home, and good company. And this part, good home, is where the challenge will be issued to you guys, and my colleague later will explain more. What we want to know is what our animals really enjoy and what their interests are like and maybe even what's their favourite spots in the habitat. So if we know that, we can actually replicate a similar microclimate conditions and to encourage them to spend more time to explore other spots in the habitat. Right, so about the challenges that we face. So the first part is we have a really large animal collection. So if you've been to our parks, you would see that we have quite a number of animal species at different places. And we have also a very dedicated team of animal care staff. But there's only this number of them and we really and they really spend a lot of time taking care of the animals. And with such a large collection, a lot of the demands is required to spend it with the animal to train them to actually do the enrichment setup. So this has led to us trying to maximize if we can come up with a system that help to optimize this process of them engaging the animal, for example, without them being physically near them, which means they can automate certain things and they can actually use a panel then they can at the same time do this for five or six species of animals without them opening and closing the door going into five or six habitats. And this is the idea we are talking about. Now, remember we talk about desirable behaviors and undesirable behaviors. When we mean stereotypic pacing, for example, is a 
is an undesirable behavior. It means that the MO is moving the same path back and forth, back and forth, right? But sometimes this is as a result of anticipatory behavior, which means they could be excited to go back and they know that the keepers is nearby because visually they see our animal care stuff within the area. So they are excited. But how do we prevent that? If we want to give an enrichment device, because that will include our, our staff to go in and come out and it will have to be somewhere visually being seen by, by our animals, right? But one way to avoid that is if we can trigger or automate certain things from far, which means they don't actually see the keepers and then they wouldn't be expecting certain things. And yet they are engaged because the device or the habitat itself is enriched in a way. Now, the next one that I wanted to share a little bit more on is the hunting behavior by predatory species. We have a wide collection and among them are some carnivores or like some primates which actually they can be considered predatory species and in our human care we don't give live feeding right so a lot of times how then do we encourage their hunting instinct or their behaviors as how they would have demonstrated in the wild so a lot of times some of the zoos will try giving them something mobile in the set of a device to encourage the large cats, for example, to go after, to pursue the devices. But usually these will be one time or because their strength is really strong, right? So, and that's it. So you put in and maybe they will destroy the thing. Of course, we would like to look for a longer term solution. And this is one of the things we will tap onto your thinking head if you can come up with something exciting. Okay, so with this, I will hand over the time to my colleague Salam, who will brief you more about the two challenges that we would like to issue you. Yeah, Salam. Thank you, Cecilia. And hello, everyone. And thanks for taking the time to join us today for our challenges. Um, so let's move on. Oops. So the first challenge we're actually going to be talking about a smart inhabited queue system that we're developing that we are hoping to actually increase the diversity of our animals. Okay, and as what Cecilia has um, really well uh, actually explained to you guys regarding behavior, uh, what we actually want for animals, particularly for this challenge, is to provide them a good home or a good environment for them to live in. And to care is also to know. And that is because um, with this challenge, we are also actually hoping to, to understand what our animals really enjoy in terms of the behaviors that we are expecting to elicit from our animals. And also what are their favorite spots and why. And this is with the understanding that in the wild, it's an open environment. Whereas in our Mandai setting, the animals are within an enclosed environment. So certain stimulations that we expect to, we can actually find in the wild will not be present in our parks. And this is where this challenge challenge is actually really focusing on. So um, for the inhabited queue system, you can somewhat separate it into two parts. And it actually is mentioned in the name itself, inhabited and queue system. So when we talk about behaviors, behaviors as how uh, Cecilia has explained before, should always be instigated by a stimulant or by a queue system that will actually trigger the behaviors to happen. So in terms of thinking about it much more closely, a good home that encourages behavioral diversity, oops, Oops, the, uh, that will encourage behavior diversity would actually will actually stimulate the species natural interests and senses so if you imagine yourself being in the wild where there's a lot happening birds might be chirping frogs might be croaking you might be smelling a lot of things this is actually what we are intending to do with the queue system the more queue systems we can actually provide in the environment the more behaviors we are expected to observe and of course, an active engagement with a dynamic environment is also something that we are actually looking for quite intensively, as what Cecilia has been mentioning with our training and also providing enrichment for the animals. So just imagine that the, the, the habitat that we are providing has all these elements, but to make it more dynamic, we need to actually trigger certain cues within the animal's environment. And let's just talk, briefly talk about the cue system and how it actually relates towards behavior. So of course, a cue system would actually has to elicit the senses of the animals. And we will talk about sensor stimulation. Um, different animals may be triggered by different senses more than the other. So when we talk about sense stimulation, of course, we start thinking about behavior. When an animal is showing a hunting instinct, for example, more often than not, it's actually looking for the prey. It's looking for movement. It uses its sense of smell. And of course, it also tries to 
think about what is actually the thing, the behavior that is actually going to be conducting. And as you move on towards different species and different prey items, for example, a bird, for example, will elicit more uh, auditory senses, for example, because it needs to hear the birds rather than look for the birds. And of course, other uh, cues that can also come from the environment themselves. For example, leaves rustling, um, rain falling. All of this information are actually very stimulating for the animals and will actually elicit a specific set of behaviors. So just to wrap up about what, how cue systems are actually useful is the solvers could actually start thinking to propose appropriate cues for appropriate species, for example. And some examples might be visual projections, sound recording, um, but one thing, an insight actually towards the animal's life um, as humans, we depend a lot on our visual uh, perception and also our auditory perception. But for animals, they actually smell quite a bit. They are olfactory systems. That means how they actually uh, digest the information from their environment mostly comes from their nose. So this is also some of the information that will be very useful for all of you to start thinking about um, how the animals can actually sense their environment. Okay, and for a cue system to really be effective, for example, it needs to elicit a response from the animals. So for example, you can probably knock a door and the animals could probably not elicit to it. But if you knock it in a certain way that probably mimics how a fruit drops, that could elicit a real response because the animals could understand, oh, that is actually probably could lead me to food, for example. So the cue system should actually elicit a response from the animal. Um, and the method may include uh, dispensing food or reward systems. And this is because when the animal hear rain, for example, the immediate behavior is to find shelter. So that is actually how the um, rain sound provides the behavior to finding shelter. And if you want to elicit a good behavior, of course, as Cecilia has mentioned, it's regarding food. Anything that is regarding food, the animal will understand that the behavior will lead to a reward that the animal actually needs. So that is what makes a cue system effective. And of course, uh, in terms of a closed setting uh, within Mandai Wildlife Parks, we want a remote activation and the control of cues. And this is because of the anticipatory behavior that we were explaining just now. We do not want the animals to actually associate, for example, all these cues with the keeper. If this could be automized in some way, then the animals will actually just be triggered by the cue itself without recognizing that it's connected to the keepers. And that will be a very ideal situation for the animals. And of course, the animals must be able to perceive the cues. It needs to actually elicit a behavior and understand the cues. The cues needs to be concise in a certain way because we don't want it to be mixed up. There's a thousand different fork noises. Yeah, okay. And there's a thousand different fork noises. For example, it needs to be discreet and the animals need to understand, oh, this sound is actually forcing me to go to a certain area and of course the sound needs to, uh, for example if you're using sound it needs to be consistent because if you keep changing probably the level of volume for example or the pitch the animal will understand it differently because in the wild environment it needs to differentiate different types of cues quite specifically actually Okay, so this, this is where we come to the second part of the challenge. After understanding behavior and the cue systems that we're looking for, it needs to be species specific. And this is actually quite important because the habitat that the animals are in are also very species specific. So the areas of interest or targets that we are actually looking for are actually our carnivore species and because we want to elicit a lot of behaviors associated to carnivores primates are really really smart so the cues that we have to provide to them have to have a certain level of diversity and especially for herbivore, herbivorous animals these are the animals that eat plants which are usually the prey items for our carnivores um, is that it needs to be wide ranging as well because they roam in very large distances so that is the first uh, the speed when we're thinking about the species that we are providing this cue towards. And of course, like we've said before, predatory species is something that we really would like to work on much more importantly because most of the prey uh, of the predator species, um, it's a whole suite of behaviors when we talk about hunting. The animal needs to find its food, it needs to locate its food, it needs to process the food before it consumes the food. So if we could even elicit different stages of cues at different levels, that will be ideal as well. And of course, we need to have a very versatile monitoring system. It's because primates may be in the tree, um, herbivorous animals may be in a wide field, um, whereas our prey animals might be in on rocks or on certain exhibit uh, furnitures as well. And of course, the behaviors of entrance, um, like we've said before, we would really love to have a whole diversity of, um, of behaviors that could elicit from different cues. 
target and stalking would probably um, come from a queue system that is more towards animals rustling around. Um, patrolling or foraging behavior may come from um, an auditory or, or, or an olfactory system where the, we can elicit smell with the animals to start chasing the smells all over the habitat. And of course, hunting and packing usually uses um, their auditory or their visual system. So a projection that the animals could actually run towards the queue device, for example, would also be ideal. Oops. And just to give all of you some form of visualization on what we are going to be expecting is actually just imagine this is the habitat of the tiger. And if the queue system would be to deploy all around the exhibit, we're able to move around and trigger specific behaviors at specific locations within the habitat themselves. And of course, with all of these cue systems applied, the main thing that the animal care or the life sciences is very interested in is of course to learn more about our animals. What are they most stimulated about? Which sounds are we able to instigate different behaviors? And of course, what are their spatial preferences and um, stage allocation within their habitats? And this is with the understanding that we are trying to create as much dynamic as possible within their habitat system. We are trying to use as much usable space and we would like to treat as much behaviors within these spaces that we provide for our animals. No worries. Yeah, we would like to accompany with some form of monitoring system. So as you can imagine, if we place all the queue systems in within the surrounding, we have to capture pictures and footages of how the animals are interacting with those devices, but more importantly, are exhibiting the behaviors that we are desiring and that we are trying to elicit from the animals. And of course, the data that we're capturing would come, would have to be processed in some form of manner because behavior, for example, would have to come how much, how, what is the extent of the behavior? What is the duration of those behaviors? And these are all important features for us to actually evaluate and to actually understand whether we are actually increasing the welfare of our animals or not. And of course, the data has to be stored and captured uh, safely within our closed system because these are actually very sensitive information, understanding the movements of our animals and what our animals are capable of doing behaviorally. So sensitivity in terms of capturing the data and processing uh, the data is also very important. And of course, with data capturing, there, is form, there, is, there should be some form of analysis. And this is the ultimate goal. When we are providing an inhabited queue system, for example, we need to be able to analyze the data that we're capturing and truly justify that we are actually providing increased welfare and optimal states for our animals. So of course, the data would try to analyze the animal behaviors, for example, how the animals have been moving within our habitat and how the animal activity has been conducted. That means when we look at the whole activity budget of an animal, oh, we see the animals actually um, consuming more food by just these devices. The animals are interacting socially much more appropriately with our with other animals. Those are all desired behaviors that we hope to capture with this inhabited queue system as well. Okay, so that's just briefly describing the OIP challenge itself. Now it's just to clean up the, the details regarding the challenges. So of course, we require some form of support and maintenance for the system that we're going to be developing. And of course, the, uh, the device needs to be functionality, durable, operatable by our animal care staff. And of course, when we talk about technology more often than not, um, at certain levels, there are different levels where we can actually engage the animal care staff. And the best thing that we could provide assistance to them is to, to have something that is very user-friendly and easy to use. That means the keepers can operate it when they are in the habitat, when they are close outside, and where the support could actually be, uh, where the animals could actually just service the system on their own as well. And of course, the support should last at least six months after the installation of the final product, of uh, uh, proof of concept, for example. And the solution has to be secured based on our Mandai IT security measures. And as you guys know, we are expanding uh, quite largely um, with a rapid pace as well. So we have to start thinking about scalability and costing as well. And that is where the modular and scalability aspect is quite important. Um, something that is low power is very ideal because we have a lot of habitats that is scattered um, within where it's very difficult to actually get power access to it. So low power, uh, even it being solar and all those kind of things is very important. It needs to be easy to maintain because we, as we scatter it throughout 
throughout our parks as well, the, the keepers, the operational staff who actually have to maintain the system. Uh, we need to be able to scale it up to most of our exhibits, hopefully, and across all five parks, considering the different species that is available in within our habitats. Um, and last but not least, of course, it needs to be able to support future deployment across all other conservation efforts. So if you could think about if this is uh, a way for us to actually elicit good behaviours, desired behaviours for our animals, we imagine the wider conservation community will also be interested. And of course, once if you accept, if you choose to accept the challenge, we will start to discuss about this a lot more. Okay, so that is um, the end of our uh, first challenge. Um, we will move on to the Q and A um, for a bit before moving on to the second challenge. Definitely, thank you so much, Salam, for the presentation. And I'm sure we learned a lot more, uh, not just about the possible tech solutions, but a lot more about the animals um, behind the scenes at the Mandai Wildlife Group as well. So we're going to take questions right now, both from our in attendance audience as well as our audience who are together with us on Zoom. So we shall start from the ground over here. Does anyone has any questions? to post to Salam at this moment or do you need a moment to consider first so we can move on to the online yeah yes uh, gentleman over there yeah my question is regarding your uh, system right it should be fast but a lot of research behind the screen right there might be some research done by somebody can you then implement that research in your whatever device you're making or the system you're making so do you expect the targets to everything will be done or do you be providing the research on your side part of this Right, please allow me to repeat the question to the Zoom audience as well. So uh, this gentleman over here has mentioned that uh, there should be a lot of research that has been done in the queue system um, So in order to implement these devices. So for this research data, is it supposed to be provided um, by the startup or by Mandai Wildlife Group? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, okay, to answer your question, actually a lot of research has been done. We actually quite understand how Q system works, how uh, positive reinforcement works as well, and of course across varying species. And of course, we as the subject matter expert for the animals, we will provide as much support as we can. We can provide you with some of the research that's already been done, some of the data that we are actually specifically acquiring, and we could actually elaborate more on the type of data that we are also capturing. So this is, of course, we will be working quite closely together in terms of fine tuning the information that we are actually capturing. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for the question. Any more questions from the ground over here? Any questions pertaining to the technology or the animal cue system over here? All right, so we shall send to some questions because uh, some of our online audience has got some questions for Salam over here. Sure. So the first question is actually zooming in on particular species, which I felt was um, rather important as well because uh, MWG is pretty wide ranging in terms of the exhibits and habitats as well. So um, from an, uh, an attendee, um, he or she says that understand that three species were mentioned just now. Uh, they had carnivores, primates, and herbivores. So what species will this prototype focus on and how does the habitat look like? Now, two I think to further distill this question, because earlier I believe there was uh, we were talking about predatory animals being the focus. So any other subtype within the predatory type of animals? Okay, yes, I think there's, there's quite a bit of clarification. So when we talk about the just now, when I give you examples of primates, um, herbivores, and carnivores, those are actually not species. Actually, those are actually taxonomic groups, and within each of those groups, there's thousands of species. So when we talk about mandai, we have over a thousand species of animals to work with. When we talk about carnivorous species, we have over 100 species. And when we talk about primates, we have over 60 species. So that means each species would actually perceive the environment slightly differently. But understanding there is a range within each species. So for example, our herbivorous animals, they are, uh, the auditory system is way much more developed than, of course, the primates, uh, for example. And um, for our predatory animals, their visual perception is much more. So when we are developing this systems, we need to actually consider quite specific species and the range of how they can actually perceive the environment. Definitely. So is there any spe uh, specific species that the prototype will focus on and uh, how does the habitat look like? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, so I think when we do the type visit, we will definitely get to know our uh, tigers, for example. So that is an area of focus. Um, because our tigers, for example, um, within the wild, they are actually free-ranging. That means uh, technically they are ranging to hundreds of miles and they will constantly be looking for 
for food. And this hunting behavior that the tiger actually exhibits in the wild is actually technically once a week. And then, however, it is very important for them to actually strengthen all their muscles. So when we talk about uh, targeting hunting behavior, it will focus on our big cats and also some of our um, uh, canine species, such as the red bulls. Right. And I think the uh, habitat was earlier explained uh, a little bit in the slide. Yeah, there's some visual reference as well. Maybe um, you could also sign up for the tour, right? That's on 13 July. Mm -hmm. uh, once again, it's not an excursion. <laughs> and remember to sign up by 12 July, but you're going to see the back of house, which is, I think, even more interesting than excursions. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we do have the uh, next question over here. How is that diverse behavior currently encouraged? I think this is a pretty important question. And how is it being monitored for effectiveness? Are there any like existing CCTVs monitoring the animal's behaviors? Nice. Okay, yes, definitely. So uh, on a constant daily basis, the animal care staff, part of his actually daily duty is to enrich the lives of the animals. And to enrichment um, and uh, training, for example, we group it under behavioral management. So it's a whole field where we actually try to instigate as much behavior through providing enrichment, um, changing the exhibit design of the animals, providing furniture, and most importantly as well, through training. And training is where we actually got a lot of information from this Q system. Systems. Because we want the animals to elicit specific behaviors, we have to train the animals to actually show this case, uh, these specific behaviors. And this is actually the, the most engaging part where the animals are actually enriched. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Salam. And I think um, we will have a lot more questions coming up later. And do not worry, because the second challenge week um, coming up, I believe Salam is going to share that with us as well. It's closely related to the first group because we are going to talk about the smart programming of the inhabited queue system and remote devices, which is directly linked um, to the first challenge group. So um, let's allow Salam to share with us the second challenge group before we get back to the questions. Salam, okay. please. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for the questions. Yes, please keep them coming. Um, the more questions that you actually provide is a better idea on what actually to expect within our parks. Okay, um, next challenge, please. Okay, so for challenge two, actually, um, we are going to be talking about a smart programming of inhabited queue system. But more importantly, we're going to be focusing on the smart programming aspect of this challenge. And this is with the understanding um, what we are actually looking for is actually based on the integrated overview and the monitoring program control for all of these innovation projects that we have been conducting um, for the past few years as well. And because understanding that there are a lot of things that is actually currently happening in terms of digitalizing our operational work, our understanding towards our animals, um, we need to have an overbroad smart programming system that con could consolidate all of these items. And of course, some of the challenges that we have been developing um, the inhabited queue system is the challenge previously. There are also existing devices that we have already started to use. And this may come in the form of automatic animal feeders. Um, it can come to browse feeders. And um, it may even come in the form of enrich triggering specific enrichment devices. Um, and of course, with the smart programming, we hope to encapsulate all of our understanding into understanding whether uh, all of these technologies is actually increasing our animals' well-being and of course our animal activity as well. Okay, and some of the programming and integration would have to have definitely have to be incorporated with our current devices that we've already been using. And as, as what was mentioned earlier, um, this uh, smart programming would be ideal if it was already incorporated with our inhabited queue system. And some of the devices that we've already started using are control individual groups of hardware from Challenge 1, for example, if those queue devices could be somewhat integrated into the smart programming, but also control of existing devices should be also something that we strongly consider. And this is because as we start to have a lot more devices spread out throughout our uh, throughout Mandai, uh, we need to somehow consolidate and manage these systems into, into one program. And, this, uh, and the features that we're actually looking for, um, it needs to have um, a custom sequencing of programming. For example, it needs to be modular. That means you can switch on certain systems, we can switch on certain devices. And of course, we have a safe option for various settings as well. And this to help the productivity gains of the keepers. And of course, there should be an override device activation functions because working with animals, we know there's a lot of risk and unpredictability that can happen. So with this smart programming, we are hoping that there will always be a system where we can override um, the system uh, where we can actually give the responsibility to the animal care staff um, as a whole.
Okay, just to visualize once again how the smart programming could actually affect other technologies is, as what was said earlier, the devices could be spread within the animal's habitat, but there could be settings where you could actually maneuver the animals within their habitat as a whole. Um, we could also set for different preferences and settings to trigger the animal's behavior at different timings, and this will create a whole different experience for our guests. But more importantly, it keeps the animal's life exciting within their habitats. And of course, the centralized dashboard is what we are ultimately aiming for. With all these technologies that have been created, we have multiple dashboards that we have to work around and maneuver around. And the centralized dashboard should optimize both laptop and mobile hardware devices. It can be activated and the control device it can be active, uh, activated and, and control the devices that we are going to be deploying within the field. Um, it has a sequence of setup and safe options as well. And the more memory, the more settings that we could actually provide for this with, diff, with incorporating with different technologies would be ultimately ideal. And of course, the display alerts should be engaging and user friendly as well. And we need to be able to report whether the devices are faulty, whether they're working, how efficiently they're working or not. And of course, in Inevitably, will lead to our understanding in the animal behaviors and any anomalies that we can observe from the activation of these devices. Um, and of course, some recommendations to the tech solvers. Um, we would highly suggest that the optimal sequencing setting is, of course, available. That means we need to be able to engage the animals with this smart programming as much as we can. And of course, we need to rank the effectiveness of this device. And this is because we want to have a continued learning platform that we could improve how we actually deploy activate and design these devices. And of course, um, with a smart programming, the smart element is also quite important because analysis is ultimately going to tell us whatever we're doing is actually providing optimal welfare for the animals. And of course, um, when we're talking about um, data processing, we have the animal's behaviors that we are eliciting. We also need to understand that these behaviors are also important data points for us to actually look at when we're intending to look at long-term trends. And of course, um, this processing would have to require to read the data, to probably process the data in some way or manner, and then to load the data set into a usable um, platform where the animal's care staff can utilize it. Um, video cameras, uh, sensors are ideal for this because the data that is captured can be quite specific. And of course, it has to inc be incorporated with fast, fast smart zoo projects as well. Um, storing pictures is really good in terms of um, understanding the behaviors because sometimes behaviors can be difficult to discern by a system. So a visual system could actually be paired up with uh, assistance from the animal care staff and of course um, the, the classifying of the data um, and how the data is, is going to be managed and classified could also be really necessary and of course once all of this is captured we need to transmit the information into a centralized data point which is the ultimate um, um, uh, target goal of the second challenge actually uh, where it's under a very secure system that could control all of the technologies that we have been developing and of course, when you are talking about data analysis, artificial intelligence, deep learning and machine learning is also an area where we are really exploring quite a bit and we are really interested in because based from previous explorations as well, um, the data analysis part is what truly um, kind of encapsulates and complete the whole story of innovating for technology when it comes to animal care. We want to really understand our animals' behavior, their activity patterns, their spatial preferences within our habitats, and some deep learning capabilities in making some inferences and some conclusions based on this information um, is really, really interesting. Um, pattern detection, because we know that animals have certain pattern repertoires and behaviors that they actually stick to, and understanding them within a closed habitat um, system within Mandai is also very unique, and this is something that we could really work on quite a bit. And of course, it can help us make um, scientifically based data driven uh, or evidence based decision when we, when we start making decisions about our animals. Um, and this is because most of our decisions that we are intending to do or nearly all of it is to actually provide increased uh, welfare for our animals. And again, after explaining all of those, we are going to just have some house cleaning. The system, of course, has to have an alert user, uh, have to alert users on any issues that the program might be facing. Um, but more importantly as well, uh, it needs to have a very user-friendly interface for the animal care staff to actually use. 
and the support and maintenance uh, would be similar to challenge one, where we're expecting a six months uh, completion, which includes uh, cloud and server costs as well. Because um, this, uh, unlike the first challenge, which is uh, what we could imagine to be more hardware based, um, uh, the second challenge is focusing towards a more software based approach. And there you go, the second challenge uh, for our, our Mandai uh, OIP Open Challenge. Uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Salam. And of course, now we got an even deeper understanding of uh, what is required over here with the smart programming. Is that something like it requires a little bit of uh, internet of things and a little bit of sensors to, to actually monitor the movement as well? I'm sure uh, many of our problem solvers here are you know, running certain solutions or hypotheses through our brains at this moment, um, as Salam was sharing. So I'm, I'm not sure if anyone cares to share any questions that we have over here to clarify some of the doubts you have in implementing. Yes, anybody? on the ground otherwise we'll proceed to the virtual questions the questions from the oh yes sir in your mind do you have any standard you are looking at Right, please allow me to repeat the question to our Zoom audience as well to chime in. So, um, the gentleman over here has asked that, um, you know, they, it seems like uh, things need to be unified under, under a certain IoT standard. So, he's asking whether there's a particular standard uh, that MWG is actually looking for. Yeah, so, um, yes, I'm sure that our IT team would uh, definitely have a lot more to say about this. But um, I guess for the proposing in terms of this challenge per se, what we're actually looking for, of course, when you look at a smart home, for example, the lights may be operated in one system, the television. Vision, um, the water heating system, and of course, there is actually controlled by a major um, uh, overall macro uh, management system that could actually trigger all of these devices separately. Of course, we also understand that because these technologies are kind of developed separately with separate systems and platforms that they've been using, um, there needs to be some form of synchronization within the future when we are thinking about this whole smart mobile game. Of course, we have to work with the hardware as well in some point. So, uh, to answer your questions, once we uh, ready to accept the challenge, our IT department will brief you on a lot more regarding the details that we require. Yes. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a very reasonable ask as well in terms of implementation. Now, I sense that um, some of the information will be made more publicly available or rather available to those who sign up for the tour. Once again, that's um, to be signed up by 12 July and the tour will happen on 14 July, I believe. So um, do contact them if you would like the, the, the tour to understand a little bit more. Yeah, anyone else with um, questions on the floor? Otherwise, we'll go on to the questions by our virtual audience. All right, cool. So over here, we do have some of our attendees asking, what are the, some of the existing inhabit, inhabited devices? Are they API enabled? Um, okay, um, first, uh, to answer the first part of the question, yes, we have currently a few devices that we are actually uh, activating uh, physically, that means, um, and that will be the browse feeder, for example, those are the feeders that will be triggered automatically uh, for time settings, for example, probably 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock in the day, and will be triggered, that is probably one system. We also have a pellet dispenser, which actually dispenses pellets uh, within the exhibit itself, and this can only be done remotely, and we have a system that is operating using a, uh, a web-based in-app uh, system as well. Um, and we've also been developing other technologies as well based on different systems. So yes, there's actually multiple, um, uh, but we can we will only share with you um, after accepting the challenge, of course, and elaborating a bit more. Definitely. That sounds like fair, fair ask as well. So we've got another question on, from the virtual community as well, that besides tracking environmental factors, what other factors will impact the animal's behavior for analysis? 
Ah, okay. Um, this is a very good question because I I'm assuming that the, the person that's asking uh, probably will understand a bit about behavior. Behavior is really really complex, and environmentals could play a part. Internal factors could also play a part. The condition of the animals as well, and, and the animals will actually be showing different behaviors at different life stages, for example, and different scenarios. We understand that our reptiles would just shut down when it's raining, for example. They would refuse to eat and they would just keep quiet and probably just maintain their energy levels. So these are the kind of behaviors when we are discussing a lot more deeper uh, in terms of the behaviors we're looking for, we have to really go towards species specific, actually. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thanks for the question as well. Now, we're going to throw back on the floor anyone else who has uh, questions to ask regarding these two challenge briefs that were put forward. Right. And of course, when you go to openinnovation.sg, you will be able to sign up and also get a more thorough brief um, before actually heading down to the zoo for the registration as well. Now, I do have another question from Tian Yu. Tian Yu says, animals in the wild are more alert for the sake of their survival. But if the queue, um, if a queue suggests a possible danger, is it actually good for the health of a captive animal? Mm. Ah, okay. This is a very active debate in animal behavior field, for example. But one thing we know that there are significant stresses, for example, that if prolonged, it's actually bad for the animals. But there are actually stresses on short durations which are actually good for the animals. For example, the animals need to have a certain level of anxiety and alertness to actually hunt. So this is a behavior that we want to know the animals actually understand it. They could actually fail, for example. And this will actually put a sense of behavior, a, a, a distinction between that behavior and other behaviors. So to answer the question briefly, yes, definitely. Um, there, there will be specific behaviors that we need to trigger and we need to trigger very closely to how it's done in the wild. Mm, I see, I see, I see. So, um, when there any final questions from the floor, you can just raise your hands. But I actually do have a question of my own. I was just very, very curious because we keep talking about queue system and monitoring as well. So, is there a need to build some sort of a reward system to depend, dispense a treat in, in the sense of a carrot or stick situation, kind of uh, to encourage positive behavior in the animal? Oh, that is a really good question. Again, um, as we've said earlier, so the browse feeders, the pellet dispensers are already considered as reward systems. Of course, this system could also be paired with that or also could come up with its own reward system. We understand that some animals, um, a reward would actually just to be investigating something. That means a new uh, sound cue, for example, that is already triggering a reward system, alertness, for example. And, and there are some rewards, for example, hunting or animal movement should be paired with a positive reinforcer. That means a food reward that will actually confirm the animal that, okay, I keep following this behavior, I will get a reward reward and that would actually encourage activity level so yes a reward system would be ideal to be paired with the queue system also that's amazing we don't only just uh, give food as rewards i think certain um, feel, good feelings in that sense will also trigger yeah positivity in the animals so um any final questions for salam before um, we go on to the next challenge with so i assume not thank you very much salam thank you so much let's give you a big round of applause thank you sure. thanks for looking after the animals and i believe it's a uh, national pride as well do you as okay I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Did you accept the challenge? <laughs> the meme asked. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next. Thank you very much. So we have taken care of uh, many species at the zoo, in the zoo itself. Now we need to take care of one final species, the species that is coming to the zoo, humans, right? So we now have the final challenge brief that is uh, regarding the hands-free digital access for a seamless and interactive guest experience. As you know, the Mandai Wildlife Group does have a lot of different attractions, a lot of different habitats, but it's in the interest both of the consumers as well as of the group to synchronize and to harmonize and to integrate these different attractions, um, the payment methods, many, many different things like itineraries, um, ticketing, there's a lot to um, be explored in this field as well. So today joining us, we do have our manager of Mandai Wildlife Group. Let's welcome Ka Kia. Kia. Let's welcome Kia with a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for taking your time down to come here and those online as well. Thank you for taking your time. So what I'll be briefing you guys will be the third challenge, which is the hands-free digital access for seamless and interactive guest experience. So we'll call it the Mandai Tech for short. Yeah, so, okay, just let me just briefly go through what I will be saying today. So, I will give you the context of the Mandai Tech, and then after that, I'll talk to you about the requirements for this project and uh, the deliverables as well. 
So as Emma has mentioned earlier, this is our Mandai Rejuvenation Project where we have the entire Mandai precinct, including the four parks, which is Singapore Zoo, River Wonders, Night Safari, and our new Bird Paradise. We have new ones, if, um, for example, like the Rainforest Well. We have indoor attractions and our new uh, Eco Resort Hotel as well. So this entire project will be called the Mandai Rejuvenation Project, and I'll be referred to this as the Mandai precinct from now on. Yeah, so what is actually the problem statement? So the first thing is that for each project director, for each park director, they want something that allows for like a ticketless admission or interactive station. So like, for example, if you go to an enclosure and you're like, oh, I want to know more about this, you tap and something will appear something like that um, and also for the resort hotel part they want like a smart keyless entry to hotel rooms and lastly because our attraction um, has a lot of families right so we're thinking is there something we can do with the physical and the digital interaction for children who do not have mobile phones so they can remain engaged in the entire Mandai precinct as well so what is our North Star? We want to create a single standardized Mandai tag across the entire Mandai precinct. So of course the key attributes is it is able to work in, across the entire precinct. We need to have it in multiple form factors and we also need to support multiple use cases which I will go on to explain. So what are the requirements for this project? We have different form factors in the Mandai precinct. Um, for example, we need to use it for FMB purposes in retails, in paid rights that we will have in the new precinct, um, some adventure rights where phones will be prohibited in the space, as well as the Mandai app, which will be coming soon. So um, to give you a rough, brief idea of what we kind of want, so looking at the first one is the Disney Magic Bands where they do like unlock hotel rooms and you know they do have water parks so they have like a wristband which like they can just tap and it's like waterproof and they don't have to use their mobile phones. Yeah, as well as the Princess Cruise Medallion, which when they walk towards their hotel room doors, and then it will just automatically open for them. So these are things that we aspire to be, but we do have, I do have the caveat that, you know, in Singapore, um, 50% of our guests are locals. And the thing is, um, we do not have the amount of information that um, these two case studies might have. So that is one caveat that we will have. Yeah, so for Singapore Zoo, it's around a 50-50. So 50% locals, 50% foreigners. For Night Safari, it's around an 80-20. So 80% it's um, local uh, tourists. So how do we imagine the form factors to be? So we want it to be very compatible with like plushies, our ranger buddies um, binoculars, our ranger buddies vest, or like a soft token for the adults, which will be, we hope it will be in the Mandai app. And um, we hope that the use of batteries will not be required. And it will be very easy to use and convenient. Um, a big part will be the sustainability part. If we're able to recycle or reuse this tech, and of course, um, waterproof and aesthetically pleasing. So what is um, the use cases that we're looking at? So there are three use cases. The first one will be the explicit tab. So explicit tab, um, for example, will be, let's say, um, a keyless entry to the hotel room, or it's just a NFC payment. For the gantry, we are thinking of, you know, instead of having to tap something and walking into the new parks, are we able to like just walk through the gantry and for valid tickets, we can just enter easily? Or And the last thing will be the proximity. So is there a way that we can detect crowds? So for example, if I don't want to go to a crowded area, am I able to see like, oh, where, where is, where in the park where it's less crowded, where I have a more like a nicer or quieter area for me to like enjoy the park as I want to? Yeah. 
So um, some technical requirements will be um, like data security. Um, the second one will be the enrollment and dissociation of text. So if it's reusable, are we able to enroll it to, let's say, um, a specific ID and then we dissociate it? And then the thing is we have a lot of other software and content use cases, right? Are we able to synchronize everything together to make it seamless? And of course, the encryption, because we are going to have a lot of information in that tag itself. So let me bring you through the user journey that we aspire for um, every guest who are coming into the Mandai Precinct. So I will break it down through the pre-part experience, the in-part experience, and then the post-part experience. So how is it? So firstly, you can either purchase your tickets online or on-site, and then you'll collect the text in the Mandai Precinct itself. And then after that, if there's a way for us to do a valid entry into the, into the parks using the smart gantries. And then after that, inside the park, we have many different things. Like, for example, if I'm having lunch, I'll just tap and I'll just pay it. Or let's say if it's my birthday, I go in, I tap it, and then someone says, happy birthday, Kia. If there is something like that, that is what we aspire to have. Yeah, and that will be the impact experience. So for postpart, is there a way to deactivate and dissociate the text? If it's a disposable tag, we need to dispose of the text sustainably. If it's a reusable tag, how do we sanitize it? And then we reissue the text to go on to for the next um, set of guests to collect. So what are the deliverables? So what is the aspiration for our Mandai ecosystem? So currently we have the Mandai, Mandai online ticketing system as well as the e-commerce. Um, what we will have is the Mandai ID that is coming soon. So it's unique to your own self. There's the Mandai app. And then we, will, we also have like the Mandai in-park retail and f &B stores. So I will go through with you through the entire experience in the pre-park, in-park, post-park. So in pre-park, when you, when you purchase your tickets online, so you will have, um, uh, you'll be associated to your Mandai tag on the day of visit. So when you purchase a valid ticket, when you collect your Mandai tags on site, you will already be tied to you with your Mandai ID as well. So using the Mandai tag, once it's associated to your Mandai ID, you can just walk into the park seamlessly. And then inside the park, in the in-park process, what, what can you do? One tap to purchase your FMB or your retail stores. And then in in-park as well, let's say, um, because we do have a lot of families who are going, right? And, it, and as I explained earlier, I wanted a digital interaction for the kids as well. So for the kids, is there a way for the parents to have some UI controls to, let's say, uh, okay, I put how much credit into your into your um mandai tag for the kids and then the the kids can go out and play and then is there a way for me through the, through the mandai app to look at the crowd density of the entire precinct as well as post park after after i leave mandai precinct am i able to see all the activities that i've done all the purchases that i've made inside the mandai precinct and of course all this we all interact with each other to come up with an entire Mandai ecosystem. So this is a sample architecture of how we see or a possible um, yeah, architecture for the proof of concept. So we want the Mandai tag with uh, a scanner of receiver together with the Mandai ID that we will provide to you. You associate the Mandai ID to the Mandai tag into the back end server where all of the Mandai tag scanner and the Mandai ID will fit into this back end server. And you will publish it where we will have different systems to have to receive all these individual information and display it here. So, for example, if I'm here and I have a unique Mandai ID, I just go to the interactive station, I tag it. Are they able to, they have to be able to understand which who I am and which station that I'll be interacting with at that point in time. 
So this is just a sample architecture of what we perceive um, the proof of concept to be. And feel free to surprise us as well. Um, if you have better solutions, definitely we'll invite you guys to come and like, you know, tell us about it. Yeah, but um, these four that I've highlighted are the ones that you will need to deliver. So um, in no order of um, in no order of importance, what we want is a working prototype. Um, of course, we need it to be scalable for costs and operalization. And we need um, you to fulfill the technical requirements. Our track record will be good to have. And of, of course, the soundness of your POC approach. So this is my contact number. Um, or you feel free to approach me um, anytime later. And any questions? Thank you very much to Kia for the presentation. So, and um, yeah, I think I believe you do have questions from the floor. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, has anything part of the world inspired your exploration today? Okay, thank you for your question. Sorry, Kia, just let, allow me to uh, repeat the question for the online audience as well. So uh, this gentleman has asked, has any theme park in the world um, inspired your approach to this today? Yeah. Thank you for your question. Um, so I think just now when I mentioned Disney and the Princess Cruise Medallion, of course, those are things that we really want to achieve and aspire to, right? Because, I mean, it's very seamless. You just get one tag and where, wherever you go, you can just like tap and then at the end of, okay, for I believe for Disney, right, they only issue the text to people who are staying in the hotel because um, for like the credit card and all the credit is being credited into the hotel and then before they check out, they have to pay. So, I mean, that is definitely what we aspire to do. But of course, reality is that in Singapore, I don't think a lot of, tour, uh, a lot of locals will actually stay in the resort hotels. And, and the thing is, you know, it's a 50-50. So it's 50% of our um, guests are actually local. So is there something that we can do to have the same seamless experience Experience without um, having them, without like all these limitations. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, and anyone else with any questions with regards to this particular challenge book? Because it's kind of different from um, the previous two. In fact, very, very different because this is um, totally about guest experience as well. Yeah. Yes, sir. Is there any uh, conference or actually that? Right, so are there any payment system or e-wallets that Manda is already utilizing or planning to utilize, I guess, also in that um, newer setup? Yeah. yeah, thank you for your question. So um, as I mentioned earlier, right, the new we are actually building on a new Mandai app that hopefully encapsulates a lot of like the payment gateways as well as let's say if you are able to have some credits from the Mandai app itself. So um, in the entire ecosystem, we are hoping to synchronize everything in a sense that it's very simple Plus. But um, to really answer your question, maybe you come down for the site visit and then we can have a more in-depth discussion about it. Thank you. All right, guys. So remember to come to the back of house visit for Monday. I think that's a critical part in some of the challenges um, for the people stack of us. Do you all go to Monday as well? Yeah, you see, that's why we need to win. You need to go down to Monday on the side visit. The back of house is important, right? So any other questions over here before we move on to the online questions? Of course, we do have some time to move back as well. So actually, I do have a question for my own as I was sitting there. I was wondering, hey, if we already have the Monday app and that the phone is such a good connector in terms of like you already have NFC sensors um, and also location, which you'll be probably able to detect the, 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 the concentration of crowd. Why not just use the app itself? Just curious. I'm sure you have gone through this. <laughs> yeah, I think it's also because we understand that, you know, in the Manda precinct, there are a lot of families and a lot of the kids do not have mobile phones. So we don't want to for the kids to be disengaged because education is a very large part of Manda, right? So is there a way that we can have this digital interaction that is very very important yeah so that is why we want one of the form factors to be in a soft token so that you know parents can use it but more importantly are there other form factors such as like the ranger body vest is that something that we can put on the kids right because ranger bodies is um for the kids predominantly so it's like yeah is there something that we can have 
Yeah, on top of like just a soft token on the phone. Definitely. And I think it, it kind of builds in experience of someone coming to um, the, the, the park as well, right? Yeah. That's amazing. Thank you. And over here, we do have another question from online, which is, does the tech need to be waterproof or resistant? What is the IP requirements for the tech? I think um, earlier you mentioned it, had, it should be water resistant to say the least, but I think he's asking for the IP requirements, quite specific on the waterproofing. <laughs> Um, okay, so I bet I think once again, maybe you come down to the site visit <laughs> on 14th July so that, okay, you know. Sure, sure, sure. So, yep, come down for the site visit. That, that's your answer. But of course, I, I think there's a fair ask because uh, there's multiple different scenarios over there and I think they can better explain it in context. Uh, as mentioned by um, earlier MWG staff members as well, they do have, um, you know, working with animals can be quite tricky around the, the, the entire um, setup. Yep. And we do have another question from the floor. Yes? That, uh, that you are you are going to have a three different app coming on Monday and this app will be announced overnight. Yep. All those apps will be connected, alright. So what what what's the relationship between the app? Ah, okay. So you're asking between the relationship between the upcoming Monday app and this tracker. Is that is that what you're asking? Uh, uh, what's the relationship of the Existing apps. Is there, are there any existing apps for Mandai at the moment? Yeah, so currently uh, we are trying to get a Mandai app that which will be an all-in-one. So the Mandai ID is actually like a unique identifier for yourself. So for example, if I'm Kira, right, then maybe my unique ID is 001 or something like that. So it's not like a physical or tangible thing. But of course, when I purchase my tickets online, um, it will be tagged to my unique ID because let's say if I log in and I purchase the tickets. So when I collect my Mandai tag on site, right, it's already linked. So they understand it's, oh, this is Kia and unique number 001. That's my Mandai ID. So everything will work seamlessly together. Yeah. Right. So question. Yes, please. Same question. Sorry. Yeah. You said in your diagram one that you went up. Yeah. Do you expect the start of the event or you already have it in your pack? Okay. That's the most integration part where you're integrating your Mandai ID and your smart token with everything else. Right? Whether you want the startup to do the proposal to do the event as well, or you expect your own all right. So the question is, uh, in the event hub where everything comes together, the, the 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 main area of integration is it supposed to be done by the startup or by or provided by Mandai at the moment? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for the question. Um, because I'm not a technical person, so I may not be able to un uh explain to you specifically. But what we would like to see is. Let me just go. Yeah. 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 So what we wanted for the deliverables would be the tag, the receivers, the bank server, and the publisher itself. So you would need to um, allow us to understand like what are the individual, like which tag is it, which scanner, which receiver. So um, I'm not very sure about the technicalities. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 This is stored in the token, as you said, right? Yeah. So whenever you go to some scanner or any place, right, when you're scanning it, the backend server will get this information anyway because the scanner is integrated with the backend server. And That's the right. backend server will push it to the event hub, right? Yes. So the event hub is still your in a way. We just provide the three key information from the start of time. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes, if I understand correctly, yes, correct. Sorry, because the event listener, right? So for the interactive stations individually, um, you will not you will not need to provide them because we have our own. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yes, correct. Thank you very much. You. Come to the zoo. Yes, uh, I think we've got another question from the gentleman. I'm um, sorry, no gentleman in the beach. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think that see, sometimes it's uh, mm. Yeah. yeah. You guys have to be sure that uh, we don't find the best or even if I can find a good 
So, so what you're suggesting, in, in fact, is that whether there's a need to include so-called uh, either a proximity sensor or so-called GPS location so that we don't have to announce for lost kids, basically, the, 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 the parents can just navigate their way. My son is over there, but he told, okay, okay. Yeah, is, is there something that we're looking for? It does, it does sound... Yeah, actually, that is something... That is one of the use case. Mm. Yeah, mm. I think that's a very good point because that is something that we do consider and it will be really, really good to have. That's why we actually did come up with the proximity... Okay, that's some yeah. part of the hardware requirements is already there but in terms of using it in that uh, particular function. Yeah. yeah, so um, we hope to have these proximities so that... In, in the event that um, um, like really there's lost kids and stuff right that is our North Star like we really want to aspire to that because um, I think it will help a lot of logistics and you know panicking and everything it will really help to have like a whole seamless experience for the guests and families as well thank you for pointing that out thank yeah. you very much yeah that can be an add-on to the 50,000 after <laughs> <laughs> yes a gentleman over there in the pink shirt yes project. Are you looking at something similar? In that kind of category, also, are you looking at something like that? Fifty thousand dollars. I'm just not sure. But secondly, assuming if we can provide you a whole set of these solutions, the question is: Are you hoping to own the IP, or are you going to license it? What's the arrangement if you don't provide the whole solution? Thank you so much for sharing your experience. The gentleman has just shared that he's actually um, been part of involved in the Disney project when it involves um, tagging and uh, across integrating the FMB restaurant and the launching solutions. And the project comes up to about eight hundred million dollars yeah, in budget. So we're asking regarding the yeah whether Monday is yeah RFID scanners yes yeah, scan equipment. Definitely. So with regards to budget and uh, expectations to um, the solutions, yes. Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, yeah, I do understand that there will be a lot of work involved and definitely 50,000 would might not be able to um, cover everything, but um, this is just a proof of concept and we will be keeping in touch with um, the winner or the, the, the group that we want to work with and like we will discuss it from there on. Yeah, thank sure, you. Sure, no problem. So, sorry, there's, there's one more question from the gentleman over there. Yeah, that we have to take in order. Yeah. You mentioned about a Bandai IP app. Yes, the app, yes. I assume the current vendor will be very open to the leaders to implement this application. Right, so whether there's a possibility of uh, getting the Bandai app developer to work with the, the, the proposal winner for this one on this, yeah. Yes, um, definitely, because we want to have like an entire ecosystem. System. So hopefully what we want to do is the vendor that comes on board with us, we want to work that uh, we want them to work with um the developers from the Manda ID app and everything will come in seamlessly together. That is our aspiration. Yes. Thank you very much. And back to this gentleman, yes. Sorry, could you, could you just repeat that once again? From the diagram, what I understand is that the scope which you want to keep because the fifty thousand dollars mm. would be very hard to develop all this, thing, right? So you are just hoping one scanner, uh, a tag, and a front back insert, which can transmit the information when you scan it. Mm. 
I think that's a great question. You're asking about the scope of the proof of concept, right? Is it just a server, a scanner, and a tag? Yeah, is, is that, I think that's a great question to ask. Yeah, what's the scope of the challenge? Yeah, so I think um, for the tag, I think the tag is more important. We need it for multiple form factors. And then um, for the other use cases, uh, sorry, for the other ones, like the scanners, the receivers, um, the one I think we need to um, sit down and we'll discuss it to understand like what are the exact deliverables for the point uh, the proof concept. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, you need to be able to prove that it works. One or two or three at least you can have it. Yeah. Yes. Correct. Yes. Yes. I think so. Yes. Correct. I, I believe that's the the case of the proving of concept of the flow of uh in transmission of information. If that's what you're asking for, right? Yeah. yeah I, I think that was. Thank you very much for all the questions. And I think uh, there's more to be discovered when you log into their challenge proof online. More details we shared there. And feel free to contact um Kia. I believe, I believe you have your email over here as well, right? So I think this is the brief um that really got everyone really excited with the questions as well. Sounds like something that tech solvers are really adept at doing. Uh, which which I believe we came to the right place. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. I see. I see. Understand. So, so your recommendation is basically to uh, narrow down on a particular uh, feature in that sense. Is that what you're saying? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So the, the scale of things of having 4.6 million touch points in that sense will work in reality. That's a great question as well. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your question and also for your pointers. Um, I think what I want to reiterate is that this is our North Star. So um we understand realistically it might it may or may not work, but this is our North Star. So we are hoping to have a vendor who can really work with us and we will really see how it goes from here because this is just a proof of concept and yeah, this is what we aspire to have. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Kia, as well. We do have a couple more online questions, just overwhelming questions that we have over here. Thank you very much. So uh, over here, we also like to invite you to contact Kia online over here at kiahyangtan at mandai.com. Thank you very much. And of course, for the, the people who ask the questions online, we are very, very happy to take your questions. You can post it on the forum as well. Um, and I believe if I can speak on behalf of uh, Mandai Wildlife Group for the $50,000 for the other solutions, it also doesn't uh, include the full implementations of all the sensors as well right so it's the proof of concept as well you may lose with them to see what are the boundaries of the concept i think that's only fair um, to both the problem owners as well as the problem solvers but this is something that we can take offline um, in specificity so over here today um i like our former um, virtual programs over here we have had the real honor of inviting um, past winners of different challenges so to ground everything in reality so we also let them share about how they overcome the different challenges with uh, very very innovative solutions and of course uh, over here we do have our um, the really the challenge of the aviary mesh inspection I believe is the R&D manager of mobile robotics at Delta Research Center let's welcome Yang Jun that's welcome to you with mouth applause thank you hi good afternoon everyone uh, my name is Yang Jun I'm from uh, Delta Electronics so uh, thank you for having me here and I would like to share a bit on our experience, uh, both me and my team, on uh, one of the past uh, the POC that we did uh, together with Mandai. So but before I begin, maybe I'll just uh, give a brief introduction about uh, Delta, uh, uh, who we are and what we do. Uh, and also, I, I think more importantly is also to share with us that uh, not necessarily you need to have the to be of the same sector, uh, but it's really uh, uh, 
uh, I would like to share uh, our uh, where we come from and also how we actually find some common uh, grounds and uh, to have a strategic as well as a fruitful endeavor together with uh, Mandai. So uh, for Delta Electronics, we are actually a global uh, MMC. So uh, we do have a lot of uh, different uh, products and solutions in the area of power electronics, building automation, uh, industrial automation, as well as uh, power infrastructures like EV chargers and stuff. Uh, but what we do as a company is actually to uh, provide uh, innovative, clean, and energy efficient solutions uh, for not just ourselves, but also to our customer and also for the society to actually build a better tomorrow. And my team uh, that participate in this uh, OIP call uh, is from Delta Research Center. We're actually the corporate R&D uh, of uh, Delta. What uh, is our task uh, and our role is actually to uh, support Delta in terms of uh, coming out with new uh, products and solutions uh, for uh, tech innovation, and as well as uh, helping Delta to have our own uh, digital transformation journey. So uh, we do a lot of things uh, in the area of uh, Internet of Things, IoT, uh, robotics, uh, AI, and data analytics. And uh, when we got to know uh, the problem call from uh, Mandai, we were very excited uh, and drawn uh, by their desire for innovation and also how to improve uh, not just the uh, uh, visitor experience, but really how to, uh, as, as what they say, uh, provide a positive animal uh, welfare uh, ecosystem. And so we were drawn to that and we thought that, hey, based on the problem calls, uh, we found that there are some things that we could do. So the problem that uh, was at hand was actually, uh, as Mandai was uh, in, the, in the area of uh, building very large aviary system because they want to provide ample space for uh, the birds. And they also want to have uh, uh, biodiversity uh, in terms of behavior and also uh, uh, mixed species. Uh, they were building very large aviary. And I understand it's even uh, uh, world first uh, in certain aspects as well. And uh, with that comes great challenges as well, just to uh, monitor uh, the aviary meshes because the, the aviary meshes are very big, right? It's actually very difficult to locate a bridge uh, which could result in uh, the birds escaping uh, and, and also injuring themselves. So the objective of this uh, problem call was actually uh, how to implement an autonomous uh, aviary mesh monitoring system. And uh, the, the problems to solve, right, uh, is uh, most of the aviary as is very large, right? The, the, the meshes surface were actually uh, at very high height. So uh, it's a very challenging for the human to actually uh, do the inspection. And it's very uh, liberal. Uh, it takes up a lot of human labor, uh, one to three days just to scan one aviary. And they have uh, dozens of uh, aviaries, right? Uh, just to show my point, uh, maybe you can take a look at this picture over here. Uh, can anyone uh, identify any uh, anomaly or any defects in, in this area? Maybe just a show of hands, anyone could uh, spot something unusual. Ah, okay, so the people are green are quite uh, adept in doing that. So actually, if you look closely uh, over here, you can actually see some uh, defects. So over here, these are defects that actually have been patched up. Uh, so this is the bird paradise still under construction and, and they, they are patching up. Lah. And you have to go very close in order to see uh, the, the defects as well. So, and that just shows my point. Uh, it's actually a, a very real challenge uh, that they face uh, day to day. And also, uh, it uh, takes time away from uh, the zookeepers uh, from actually uh, taking care of the animals. So we came on board uh, to uh, try to tackle this uh, problem. Uh, we have similar technology uh, uh, using IoT solution uh, where we have a combination of sensing and AI technology 
and we do it uh, in our factories uh, with our clients for predictive maintenance. So we install sensors uh, on our manufacturing equipments, uh, we monitor them, uh, and it allows us to be able to detect any uh, defects early on, even predicting when it's going to happen and also estimating the remaining useful lives. So we have this uh, technology uh, is uh, quite similar and uh, we implemented it over uh, in Mandai. Of course, definitely there will be adaptations that will be required. It's not the same, not at all, okay? And uh, But the technology is quite straightforward. Lah. We just need uh, to have uh, an active device, an actuator paired with uh, a number of sensors. So the actuator will actually give a specific uh, known uh, vibration pulse, which we know. And then uh, we will be able to then uh, isolate what are the, the noise uh, that's coming from the mesh and not from the environment, right? And, and this is uh, in essential what uh, this system is all about. Right. So, uh, but because uh, it was a POC, we only had six months, uh, and it's not exactly the same. We need to adapt and also train the uh, model. Uh, even though we are MMC, we also have to be like a startup. Uh, we use the lean uh, startup approach, uh, build, measure, learn to repeatedly uh, try to uh, understand from our experience, uh, from our experiment uh, on site and also in our lab uh, in order to uh, be able to uh, uh, complete this uh, POC, All right? So uh, these are some pictures of, of the system that uh, we have implemented. Uh, so uh, the stage of the project, actually, we just completed all uh, deliverables, uh, 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 one week ago, and now we are in the final presentation uh, uh, stage. So uh, that's why I'm a bit more relaxed today. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but uh, as you can see, uh, we developed a, a system, a prototype uh, that can work uh, on uh, the every meshes, right? Uh, we did it both on site as well as on uh, some uh, replicate meshes. Why we need replicate meshes? Because uh, we can't possibly cut the actual enclosure. So, so we have replicate uh, meshes to actually uh, cut uh, and, and also uh, simulate uh, the defects. Like. So uh, the overall system, and, and we created a, a dashboard uh, to, to actually sh uh, alert uh, the, the zookeepers on uh, any uh, anonymity. And we achieve a uh, 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 accuracy of uh, probability of detection of around 71% for uh, cut and holes and also a 6% uh, false alarm rate. So, of course, these numbers are still uh, can very much uh, be improved uh, in order to be operational ready, but uh, it met the objectives and the targets of the POC and uh, we believe that with more data uh, training, uh, we can actually get it to perform uh, better. And then finally, we deploy a small scale uh, set of uh, 32 sensors on the actual bird paradise uh, 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 site, which is still under construction. Yeah, so there's uh, just uh, one week ago. <laughs> okay, some challenges we face, right? Uh, I guess uh, we, I'm here today to share uh, our experience. Uh, uh, so one of the biggest uh, difficulty we had was uh, we are very used to uh, dummy proving our uh, products right, uh, for users uh, in, in the factories and stuff. But to be animal proof is another thing altogether. Okay, so uh, the animals are very curious. Uh, every time we go there, uh, probably we learn that maybe we need to buy green t-shirts in order to uh, blend uh, better over there. Uh, but every time we're there, they, uh, they will come and uh, check us out uh, and also uh, test our uh, durability of the device. So we needed to learn very quickly and we needed to learn on the go. And here we were very thankful uh, through this. We really understand a lot more about animals, how they behave, what they like, what they don't like. Uh, and, and this helped us uh, to be able to uh, come up with the overall uh, solution so that uh, it can really uh, meet the needs of uh, uh, Mandai and also solve the problems, right? Then at the same time, there's also a very big difference between the ideal con 
uh, condition, right? Uh, we are used to uh, working in our uh, factories for smart manufacturing, uh, predictive maintenance. Uh, the environment is very clean, very organized, very uh, very well uh, maintained. Not to, not to say they are not doing a good job. It's just that it's an outdoor environment, uh, harsh weather conditions. Uh, and you know, the past few months is very heavy downpour. Okay, so we needed to really uh, uh, move quickly from the ideal condition by just immersing ourselves uh, in the environment. So we encourage all the team to, as much as possible, bring the earliest prototype down uh, to Mandai uh, as soon as possible so that we can really uh, uh, learn and also innovate uh, and constantly go back to the drawing board in order to uh, solve all the uh, different uh, problems at hand. Right? So these are the lessons that we learned along the way, right? Uh, first of all, like I mentioned uh, uh, immerse yourself uh, in the environment, right? Uh, by the way, this is not a tent that we sleep in now, okay? Don't worry, okay? We're not uh, asked to do that. <laughs> uh, it's just to keep the system uh, uh, cool, okay? Uh, but really, uh, to immerse yourself in the environment, we felt that it helps us a lot uh, when we are down there, we see the actual situation, the context, and also how uh, then we can better understand uh, what the zookeepers will find uh, easy or difficult to use. Right, uh, and uh, six months is not a long time, so we needed to pace ourselves, uh, tackle one problem at a time. So, uh, there were days that uh, some things work, some things don't work, there were days that nothing worked. So, uh, you really need to pace yourself and also uh, to tackle the problem. And we find it quite helpful to really communicate actively with uh, Mandai. Uh, they, are, they, are, they have been very uh, supportive uh, uh, to help us uh, to ease uh, into the on site situation, providing us tents and also sharing with us uh, their experience uh, with the animals, which really we do not know much, uh, but we learned a lot uh, during this period of time. So I uh, encourage everyone to communicate actively uh, over the different levels of uh, 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 the, the different uh, people in the project, right? Uh, uh, and we also have the privilege to work uh, even with uh, vets uh, uh, who, who really uh, knows uh, the animals very well. Uh, so uh, the last thing I, I'll say is uh, uh, want to enjoy the process. Uh, this is certainly something that we, we, we found it, uh, not just uh, uh, something that we uh, want to do, but really we felt that uh, this whole uh, Mandai experience also extends uh, uh, through what, as, you, as they've been sharing the whole afternoon, the things that they want to achieve and also to look forward to, uh, we, we identify with it and we enjoy the process of working with uh, such people. And, and also, uh, as a father of uh, two uh, very young boys, uh, I, I earn a lot of brownie points uh, having a project in Mandai. So uh, do, do enjoy the, this sort of certain perks as well. Yeah. So uh, that comes to the end of my uh, sharing. Uh, uh, thanks, thanks for uh, your time. Yeah. Thank you very much. And that was your Xun from Zhao Tao Research Center. Thank you so much for sharing on that very uh, mesh inspection. I think that's really something that's quite interesting. Things that we don't think about, challenges that uh, staff have to go through and spend days inspecting the aviary. I think that's something that definitely the solutions can help with. And thanks, Yong Xun, for breaking down the different steps in your implementation uh, from the concept all the way to implementing and making animal proof. Uh, as Yong Xun has mentioned, uh, going down the site is truly important because um, the zoo, as well as the other wildlife parks by Mandai Wildlife Group is quite different from the normal everyday situation, right? So next up, we also have um, another one of our problem solvers here who was working on the solution of elephant behavior monitoring, none other than the Chief Technology Officer of Ministry XR, who is Dr. Andrew Yu. Let's welcome Andrew. Thank you so much, Andrew. Yes, Hi, everyone. Uh, I want to thank uh, Mandai and IMDA for uh, giving me this opportunity. Um, and I'm really glad that this year the, the forum is a physical event. Um, even earlier on during the dry run, I already talked to um, four or five individuals and companies and 
we really got a lot of uh, very interesting, illuminating conversations going. Um, so um, our project is uh, elephant behavior monitoring. We are monitoring the behavior of elephants, um, basically. Um, and I'm just going to share with you our whole journey from start to uh, where we are now. Uh, hopefully, this helps you guys, um, you know, be better prepared to to know how to 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 do your proposals and uh, win the challenge and carry it out. Uh, just a bit about us, uh, Ministry XR. Um, we were established in 2017. Um, we do immersive deep tech solutions, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, computer vision, and so on, IoT. Over 50 projects completed. Uh, we are a very passionate group of people. Um, we are especially um, focused on meaningful applications technology. So I think working with the Mandai group, helping animal welfare, that's really uh, in you know part of our passion and um, I think pretty important we all of us in this company we really really love elephants uh, I think this really helps uh, you know with, with the mindset and the drive towards uh, this this kind of challenge a little bit more about ourselves um, we did quite a few projects uh, over the past few years virtual reality experience for rainforest preservation another um, project very close to our hearts and we presented this at uh, botanic gardens uh, we did a uh, augmented reality and eeg system to help with um, reminiscence therapy for dementia sufferers if you go to our website you can learn more about that uh, we use computer vision for skin analysis, um, for skincare product recommendation. This was in collaboration with a uh, skincare um, product um, retailer. And um, we, we've done quite a number of uh, immersive virtual events. Uh, we've done VR video production, we integrated this uh, VR chair for virtual test drive for Ford cars. This was in Malaysia. So quite a lot of projects, uh, there's more than this. Uh, one of another, another project that's I think pretty related to what we are doing uh, right now with the elephant project is uh, AgriTech. So using IoT sensors to monitor the, the, the conditions of the plantation and the tree growth and that kind of thing. So we thought that it was a pretty good fit for this particular project. Um, our, I, our OIP journey uh, basically you know, started with getting the brief, like what happened today, uh, but it was uh, an online event rather than physical. And then we went to the proposal stage and then you know, carrying out the challenge. So I'll, I'll just give some, um, I'll just share some, some points uh, at each stage. Uh, the brief is, um, in a nutshell, um, we were, uh, the, the challenge was to, to um, track um, autonomously using sensors or you know the system uh, monitor identify the elephants each elephant and monitor their behavior so there were a few different specific behaviors like standing sleeping uh, walking swaying that kind of thing that had to be ident have to be detected and uh, we need to know which elephant it is so yeah the, the targeted uh, behavior indicators that uh, also, you know, indicates um, whether the elephant is doing well or not, whether they're sick. Um, uh, part of this also, I think, early, early on in the sharing by the Mandai group, it helps with the operational processes of the, the animal care team. Um, and it was scoped to um, particularly four elephants that live together in the back of house area. So there was previous work done using computer vision to detect elephants uh, through CCTV cameras. Um, you know, from the scene. So we were asked to expand on that as well. So at the proposal stage, um, I think this was pretty important, um, gathering information from the problem owners. Uh, this time around, you get to go to the back of house um, before you know, going to the proposal stage. So that's very important. Just go to the zoo and talk to them and see what it's about, see the environment. Um, some of the important information we gathered um, elephants are highly curious and intelligent animals. I think being elephant lovers, we knew that going in, but as we go through the challenge, we really, really get to experience how true this is. Elephants are extremely, extremely strong and dexterous with their trunk. And this was a very important point for us particularly um, because of the type of animal that we're facing with. Um, you, mentioned, you earlier mentioned that there are also challenges with the birds. Uh, I think any, any um, project involving the animals, there are challenges definitely, and um, each, each type of animal has different challenges. Um, we found that elephant keepers only focus on elephants, no other animals, so they are really, really good source of information, first-hand experience with the animal. 
Um, and we also learned about the elephant's routine and how um, they, they're managed. So we were very, very impressed by um, the way that Singapore Zoo manages animals. I think they are given a lot of welfare, a lot of autonomy, um, and you know they they guys they. They have the routine where they 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 stay in the back of house and they go to the front visitor uh, to see the visitors, uh, to let the visitors see them. But um, I understand that they're not forced. So sometimes if they don't go to work, you know, they can just stay at home and and uh, the animal keepers can't do anything about it. But I think they tend to try to use cues and uh, stimuli to get the elephants to, to go to the front. So there's this very interesting insights that we got. It's also very important for us to understand how to approach the challenge. Um, so we went down to the proposal stage uh, after understanding all this background information and we did some homework uh, before going to the proposal, uh, writing out the proposal. So, um, I mean, vision based, the, the, I think for us, the tricky part was identification of individual elephants. This was something we were not very sure if it was um, very feasible within the time frame and, and this, you know, and all that. Um, and we did some research. We found that it's still an open research problem, vision-based elephant identification. We found that wearables have had success in actual use, uh, similar use cases, studying elephant behavior. Uh, we found that elephant tracking and behavioral research is a relatively active area of research around the world. Um, and especially for the behavioral analysis of elephants to see um, whether they're doing well or not in terms of welfare. So there's some research going on over. Um, you know, part of our research, we uncovered that the, this, there was this group that was uh, surgically embedding trackers in the trunk of an elephant um, to you know, basically to do a sleep study on them. So we found that interesting, but you know, um, from the, 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 the problem statement that we were given, this is not what we're, we're doing. We're not surgically inserting into the trunk. Um, there's practical reasons for us not to do that. So we also, you know, did more literature review, academic research. We found that um, there are studies and approaches how to to identify elephants based on the features around them, the ear, um, tears, and other kinds of features. Um, but um, we also found that in the wild, when you're using, when you're doing computer vision, when you're applying these computer vision algorithms in the wild, there is um, is is much there's much less success in terms of identifying individual elephants. It's more about elephant counting, um, estimating how many elephants there are in the scene, what where they are going, and that kind of thing. So these were some of the background information that we had going into presenting our proposal. And some of the, the key um, uh, approaches that we had towards coming up with the proposal, one is we looked at the vision mission of uh, Mandai Wildlife Group. It's very inspirational, very motivational. Uh, it's about uh, cons valuing, conserving biodiversity, uh, meaningful, memorable wildlife experiences, and world-class animal welfare and care. Um, I think you know there are uh, subtle ways that this helps with our mindset in coming up with the proposal and then following that, carrying out the challenge. So I think it's pretty important to keep this in mind. Um, we really focused on wanting to present a practical solution that could, you know, after deployment, could bring immediate results to the group, the Mandai Wildlife Group and the Elephant Keepers. Um, so a bit of detail here, we, we emphasize more on wearable sensors um, to be able to identify the elephants, get some motion data so that we could analyze it and understand their behavior. Um, I believe this is also a pretty um, good um, approach to the proposal, which is to demonstrate long-term value. Um, so there is a, the, uh, sorry, maybe no battery. Uh, okay, so um, we have a scope for the challenge, a very definite scope, uh, but also when, when presenting our proposed solution, we also um, give a, a view as to how it can be extended, scaled up in future, other use cases can come into play. So um, I believe this helped, I'm not very sure, maybe you can uh, find out from the Mandai group as well if this is important. Uh, coming to the challenge itself, um, so your yeah, site visit meeting with the Mandai team, super important part of this uh, at the, in the beginning. Went to understand the site environment, pretty much what Yongjin said. Uh, we got to know each other, the Mandai group, um, 
um, we get the first high, first hand insights from them. The organization structure, I think, is a very um, effective one that they have going on there. There's, there's transformation office, there's a life science group, and then there's the, the animal keeper that we really work very closely with. So get to know them, uh, get to know what they are looking at. You know, uh, different areas of the zoo operation. Um, and also very, very important, elephant behavior, the peculiarities and challenges of the animals. And they're all individuals. We learn each, you know, each of them, uh, what they tend to do and all that. They're all of different sizes. We will focus on the female elephants, four of them, for this challenge. Um, there's this stage that we went through. There's this stage called the deliverables and KPI setting discussion. So I think earlier on the questions, uh, you know, during the briefing, I think some of those could be um, treated even more during this discussion. Um, it is it is mediated by a third party that is appointed by IMDA. So the objective here is um, they mediate the discussion between the, the problem solver and the problem owner, Nandai Group. And the objective is fairness on both sides. So I think it's about being vocal, highlighting uh, what can be done, what really needs to be out of scope. Um, there's also you know, justification as to why it's a POC. We want to focus on proving certain things that are not clear that it can be done. You know, For example, are there more trivial things maybe can be left out? So just have a discussion on that. Uh, and once that's done, this, this took about two hours uh, for our case. After that, um, the third party will then come up with uh, a, do a documentation of what was discussed and then we all sign off and it's, it's a basis for the rest of the challenge. So getting deeper into the challenge and the, the specific problem domain, okay, early on we found out, we, they told us, okay, elephants are very strong, very intelligent, very dexterous, uh, especially with the trunk and thick locks and all that, right? So um, getting into it, yeah, we really experienced this firsthand, okay? Um, not that we got hit or anything, but some of the prototypes that we tried, you know, just, you know, we, we don't have them anymore, right? Um, so um, as we were doing the project, developing the wearables and the sensors, we worked closely with other collaborators and we found that, you know, likewise, they all really love animals, specifically elephants. I think that helps. Everyone's very passionate doing the project. Um, if you find someone who's not uh, an animal lover, maybe find someone else, I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, for us, because we were using sensors, putting it on the elephant, we were very conscious of the safety of the elephant. Um, so the basic material, um, choice, um, the wearable electronics, battery safety, that kind of thing, very top of our mind. Um, this is one of the prototypes that we had. Uh, we were working with a local leather worker. Um, he used to be in, a, in, a, in tech. He used to work for a German tech company. Now he, he's doing artisanal leather work. The material we chose was actually not leather itself. It's a synthetic material. It's um, biologic, uh, biologically safe, non-toxic, easy to clean, easy to wash. Understanding how the elephants behave in their habitat uh, they, they clean the mud a lot, There's, they're quite rough with it. So these were all parameters that we had to, to really remember when doing the material choice and designing the, the, the solution, right? Um, we also looked at some sensors uh, that we could use off the shelf that could provide us raw data that we could analyze. Um, these are a couple. So um, we, tr we, we went towards a more lower cost solution, like um, the one on the right. Um, I don't have the point. Oh yeah, here. This one, lower cost, a couple hundred bucks. Um, it, it has uh, Bluetooth connectivity, so we can get real-time data. There's API for us to be able to pull this data to our backend um, uh, platform and do analysis, and then provide real-time insights to to the elephant keepers. So um, this is you know how we we came to um, identifying such sensors. Um, it's also pretty ruggedly built, um, meant for active wear, uh, as opposed to the other one where that one costs uh, about uh, four thousand um, bucks. Where we were not really concerned that you know if anything breaks, the battery uh, might explode, that kind of thing. So, I'm very conscious of the safety of the animal here. Um, Key takeaways so far in this challenge, uh, we, we haven't completed it yet, you know, I think we're pretty close, so not as relaxed as uh, Yongqing yet, uh, hopefully you couldn't get there. Um, overall, we found, um, I think, approaching a new problem domain or, uh, with technology, even though we may be familiar with the technology, we have used it before, I think 
do anticipate there are very, very specific potential issues. Be prepared for that. Uh, Yong Jin mentioned a lot of iteration, try and try and redesign. So uh, we experienced that as well. Um, it is a team effort. Don't forget your the problem owners. They are the, the domain experts. They have all this knowledge. So keep talking to them. Again, like Yong Jin said, uh, we all share the same objectives. Remember that. Um, for us, our particular challenge, we placed um, practicality of the solution as a particular goal. At the end, we want to have a, a system that can already work. But as I said earlier with the proposal approach, there's also potential to expand it further. Uh, one of the things is perhaps eventually with enough data obtained, we can move away from the wearables and um, allow the system to be expanded to use solely computer vision, non-invasive. Um, but as I said earlier from the, our, our earlier research, you know, that might be a slightly longer term goal. So maybe out of scope of, of our particular, the way we are approaching this challenge. But particularity was a significant goal for us. Maybe it's different for other challenges, not sure. Um, and I think we failed a lot during the project. I think Yongjin can relate so a lot, but everything is of learning value. I think it's good to document this and present it back to uh, the, the Manda group as well. It could be useful insights for future work on this project or even other projects. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, I hope this helps. <laughs> Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences. And of course, I think uh, one of the key takeaways from Andrew sharing is also that uh, I think many of our problem solvers was also asking about the scope of the KPI. And Andrew has uh, shared with us um, regarding the KPI alignment setting. So um, what the Monday group has shown you, like um, Kia mentioned earlier, is the North Star truly where they hope to head towards uh, together with you as well. But for the KPI setting, for the scope and uh, the, the, the boundaries of this challenge, you'll be further defined on the KPI setting. So fundamentally, make the visit to understand um, the environment first. I think that's most important. And joining us next, of course, also on board with the Elephant Behavior Monitoring, we do actually also have an enabler partner. And there's none other than our friends from Amazon Web Services, our pro Program Manager of the Cloud Innovation Center. Let's welcome Richard to share some of his findings. Richard, please. Hmm. Hi, uh, evening. It's almost evening. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Richard Go. I'm from the AWS Cloud Innovation Center. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do at the Cloud Innovation Center and how we are going to um, help the innovators that are going to, you know, make proposals uh, on some of the prototypes that they might be building. All right. Okay, so um, whenever we want to talk about Amazon, we always have to talk about this guy. He's our founder, Jeff Bezos. And um, one, he's, he's quite an ins inspiring figure in Amazon. One of the interesting things that he talks about is innovation and invention a lot in Amazon. And in Amazon, we believe that every single employee is a builder. And he said this before, invention comes in many forms and at many scales. The most radical and transformative of inventions are often those that empower others to unleash their creativity to pursue their dreams. So it's not about building just an end product. For him, the most inspiring in inventions are those that give others the ability to unleash their own creativity. And that's one of the inspirations for Amazon Web Services. At Amazon, we are also customer obsessed. Where does innovation begin? It always starts with the customers and work backwards. Um, when, I, when I was speaking with uh, Mandai, I looked at this statement and I went, actually, who's the customer? Um, the challenge that you have when it comes to enclosures, is the customer the lion or the tiger? Am I going to be able to talk to them and find out what they really want? Um, that's where the... Uh, life science group come in. They are using a different method in which they understand how the animal behaviors are very important to them. And those are your customers. So for us, we build our company around a lot of our cultures, mechanisms, um, and, and the various different ways in which we organize our organization around innovation. And these are just but some of the various different things. We have taken this and we are offering some of this to our customers as well as innovators out there um, to actually um, spread the word around of how innovation should be done 
or how Amazon does it, and for them to actually take it on and even do it better. All right. So here I've got two artifacts here that just quickly show some artifacts of what we do. So we start with the customer. We ask questions about the customer, what the problem is, uh, what exactly uh, is the benefit that you need to get out of them, and so on and so forth. And these questions will then formulate the kind of thinking around the solution and the way in which it needs to be uh, built. Press release is actually not something that we release at the launch of a product, but it's something that we imagine that when you are launching the product, what would your press release talk about? Right. Along with this, of course, there are other artifacts. I'm just giving you a little bit of sampler here. Most importantly for Amazon, um, as what well, Jeff Bezos have mentioned, we want to create something that allows innovators to just quickly innovate on. So um, if you look at Amazon Web Services today, we have gone far beyond just computing services or servers or even storage services. We have 200 over plus services, everything from compute to, if you talk about uh, AI ML, uh, which is artificial intelligence and machine learning, we have a lot of services behind that, image uh, recognition, computer vision, um, and I'll show some of the um, interesting uh, videos of how some people have innovated on our technologies. Okay, so for us, this is the formula for innovation, right? So the formula for innovation is really the organization, the architecture, and it's actually exponentially increased by having a culture within an organization on innovation as well as mechanisms. What I see Manda is doing today with open innovation uh, with uh, the challenges that they're looking at working with IMDA is all within this formula here. And I think they'll succeed. Now what we have done is we took some of our um, internal Amazon innovation methods um, and what we could offer and bring it up. We try and provide uh, opportunities for nonprofit education institutions, government agencies, or other organizations that are addressing challenges. In Mandai, Wildlife Group is about education and conservation of wildlife. Right. And we try and offer them these innovation methods that we have, help them identify challenges, help them uh, use the Amazon method to actually innovate um, we also give our own network of builders, our internal expertise. Um, we have, for example, a group of them that are looking at robotics. I have uh, experts in uh, computer vision, artificial intelligence, and, and so on and so forth. We offer up this specialist time to actually consult and uh, provide some ideas on how certain uh, challenges and obstacles could be overcome as well as we give you a platform to prototype and scale. Now in Amazon, how do you access one of these services? You log in to a AWS console, right? You provide, uh, there's a need to have a credit card uh, number, all right? And if you need to use a particular service, you just subscribe to it. It's that simple. There's no time needed in terms of buying something, provisioning and all that. So this shortens down the time that you need in order to activate something. Most importantly, each of these service is based on utility pricing. You pay only for what you use, right? Instead of buying a whole server where you're only using a certain percentage of it, you will be able to pay based on the amount of compute time that you need. So it is ideal for prototyping. So at the Cloud Innovation Center, uh, we actually, as a result of that, um, help a lot of customers, and these are the benefits that they get. Um, human-centered solution because it revolves around the customer, what they want, what they need. Rapid prototyping, like I mentioned, if you explore the Amazon Web Services, there's really a full range of uh, services that are really, really out of the box for you to use. Low cost of failure, we understand even the previous two speakers have talked about doing prototyping, how much failures there are. Uh, we will lower the cost of it. Now, one of the things that we do is for the prototype, even the cost of Amazon Web Services that you are using will provide credit to offset the cost for you. So for Mandai, for the challenges that you're working on, if you are going to build those challenges on AWS platform, 
um, after the um, shortlisting and the winner, when we will review for the prototype, the cost of the Amazon uh, web services that you use will offset it. So it will be free from that point of view. All right. So um, just to uh, let you know, uh, Cloud Innovation Center is here in Singapore, but it's also ac across the world. Uh, you can see we have 13 centers around the world. Uh, we are a network of uh, innovation centers. Uh, we can tap on these various different centers for expertise as well. I just want to quickly move on to some examples of what we've done. This is Busan. Uh, this is a smart farm challenge. Um, in Busan or in Korea, um, they actually uh, eat these things called prayer leaf. I don't know whether, you know, if you're going to Korean restaurants, you'll see this, right? So this is an example of a smart farm that went through the Cloud Innovation Challenge. And they built, uh, this is the actual farmer who provided a challenge, all right? And a company took it up, Digilog, and they uh, built this uh, particular particular uh, greenhouse. Now this greenhouse has a lot of IoT sensors that are sensing carbon dioxide, uh, oxygen level, airflow, and so on and so forth. And all of those data points are actually sent in to AWS services. Um, there's an artificial intelligence uh, machine learning algorithm at the back that's learning. A lot of just now you will see a camera that's tracking. What the camera is doing is that it's capturing the size of the leaves and it's collecting the data of the conditions that's inside the greenhouse as well as the size of the leaves to see at what condition will the leaf grow the fastest at the most optimal all that information is passed to the server and is presented as a app mobile app to the farmer and the farmer will then decide based on that what are the ideal conditions to actually uh, close the shed increase the airflow and so on and so forth after a while, it will become an automated process where he tests out a few different uh, recommendations based on the machine learning. He will then uh, automate it and such that the system will automatically open up, close up, uh, increase the airflow. And this actually increase um, the priority leaf um, optimization in terms of its size and its quality. The second challenge I wanted to share with you is one, uh, this was done uh, in Busan uh, with the schools. One problem with, um, if you go to Korea and or you have eaten Korean before, you'll notice that they have a lot of different, um, you know, all the different small dishes, right? Unfortunately, in their cafeteria, is the same thing in the schools. And there's a lot of uh, food waste problems. So kids don't like certain things, they don't eat it, they just throw. They don't like it, they just throw. So in the cafeteria, what they have implemented is this little device. And so again, this is done together with a startup company, uh, uh, Movie Labs and One Data Technologies. They actually built this. What this does is each kid, when they have gotten their food, they will go to this machine and it will scan it. And based on the scan, you will recognize the food items. All right. After they have finished their food, they scan it again. And you will recognize what has been consumed and what has not been consumed. This delta in terms of what is consumed and what's not consumed is sent back to the cafeteria owner. And the cafeteria owner will then start to understand what kind of foods the kids like, how much is the portions that they take, and so on and so forth. This actually helped to reduce the food waste, um, I believe it's 30%. And the success of this project is such that they are now looking at how to actually expand this across uh, Korea um, schools. Lastly, this is a very interesting one. I'll just play the video. Some years ago, you all know about e-scooter, right? So this is using uh, Amazon's recognition technology. This is one of our out-of-the-box uh, computer vision technologies. Um, the camera that you are seeing is an existing camera that the um, Santa Monica City actually already have mounted on their lampposts. And um, based on this, the challenge that they had was this e-scooters, right? And the pedestrian problem. So um, this was a project in 2018 where they use it to detect where are the uh, are these uh, guys actually using the e-scooters properly? Where are they? And so on and so forth. You can see this whole bunch of guys that are suddenly flowing through. So they are detecting and seeing whether the guy is actually going down the green lane, which is where uh, e-scooters are supposed to um, be. With that, they will then uh, implement uh, interventions. Now, um, you can see some of these projects, they are not simple projects. They don't look simple. All right. Um, I, as I was sitting there and hearing some
Let him, let him. to defray capex expenses as much as possible. So what do we do? We offer the access to um, facilities and equipment such as co-working spaces, you know, 5G lab, as well as the usability testing lab. These are all pretty expensive as a first time investment. We try to actually provide it to solution providers and the corporates for free to do prototyping as well as commercialization. The second one that we talk about, right, is this idea that you need to make the product more user centric. And how do we do it? With be building user-centric products. So this is really offered by our consultants with more than 10 years of experience that we draw upon through, for instance, like UI UX design thinking and digital storytelling for you to be able to create very user-centric and customer-obsessed type of products. C, in that sense, is really about connecting with the ecosystems because for the startups or the solvers, they need the key reference customer as well as industry validation. Are they on the right track? Are they solving an meaningful enough problem? And for the corporates, they want to understand new technology as well as to access innovative startups. And that's where we do a lot of our events like Innovation Thursdays. Uh, we have actually uh, quite a fair bit of seminar spaces as well, like uh, for events as well as like programs to share about innovative tech as well as the network of both the supply and demand side. So our focus very much is on AR, VR, AI, data, IoT, robotics, as well as the 5G. So these are just some of the uh, different um, startups that we have incubated with us today, as well as some of the facilities that we have. Again, you will see that these are all where the facilities may tend to be pretty expensive as a first time setup. And that's where we find that there's most value for us to contribute to the ecosystem. So how startups and corporates can leverage us right on Pixel's capability building. Very similarly, in terms of like UI, UX, design thinking and digital storytelling, we offer it according to a diff, um, different kinds of modalities. Of course, there's always the one-to-many workshops that you're always welcome to come down. That may be virtual, hybrid, as well as physical ones. And these are the ones that is actually completely free for the uh, uh, entire ecosystem to just uh, learn how to start off with uh, innovation. Second one is, of course, this type that are a little bit more about one-to-one -one consultations, uh, very short ones in that sense. And a lot of it is like um, giving you extra, I guess, uh, TLC, tender living care, right? Uh, in that sense, uh, in terms of uh, what exactly is our innovation needs. But once you have a very clear idea of what you want to do, then the project-based coaching comes into play. 12 to 24 man days, kind of uh, um, very intense uh, sessions with our consultant to help you improve the innovation outcome. And these are also the things that we offer through the open innovation platform, especially at the project-based coaching site. 
So I'll move on to OIP. So OIP is really Singapore's uh, nas national digital innovation platform. We always like to throw out certain numbers, right? I think the number that usually gets people noticing it is that since 2018, we've done more than 300 challenges, um, worth more than $8.5 million in prize monies. And uh, what the corporates always find very meaningful is actually is that more than 11,000 uh, registered problem solvers on the network itself. And if you do a rough math in Singapore, you've got about three to 4,000 startups. And that kind of gives you a sense of our reach in that sense. Lah. Right. So um, in terms of challenges itself, pretty diverse. We like to call, we like to cut it one third, one third, one third. So you have your large local enterprises, your MNCs, your SMEs, as well as your government and sector leads uh, all having equal weightage in terms of coming out with the challenges here. Right. Um, the innovation that we are dealing mostly with that we've seen a lot of is actually AI, data analytics, and uh, increasingly much more of AR, VR, as well as IoT. And a lot of them are actually asking about customer engagement, I think that's one of the problem statements that's coming out. Process optimization, new capabilities and services. And in terms of like uh, the price money, how much do you really need to pay to actually join OIP as a corporate in itself? Um, a lot of it actually complementary in terms of the innovation consultancies because we always know that the pain point is that how do you even get started? And that's where we want to try to uh, jumpstart that entire process itself. But from the corporates, what we do require is really that uh, 20 to 50K of uh, price money to be provided for the startup itself. And that's of a lot of value, especially for a startup, because they are always thinking about it as, hey, this is just seed money with no equity involved. So I get to start very quickly and I get to eat, uh, validate quite quickly. Right, uh, solvers, I've mentioned it, uh, very multidisciplinary and also across quite a range of uh, um, countries. So I always like to end with uh, some of the proof uh, success stories and all that. Uh, um, a lot of the marquee brands across a variety of uh, industries have joined, right? Uh, Mandai has also already shared a lot about what they have already got, uh, what they have already in terms of the challenges as well as some of the success stories. So I won't over elaborate on that, but you do see that a lot of these guys are um, the big MNCs and sometimes it's quite surprising, right? Like for MNCs, don't they have their own innovation team? Why are they joining? I think a lot of it is also, they do find quite a fair bit of value in terms of expanding that network as well. And there's a lot of adjacencies that we can also help with. So yeah, I would just uh, end with that and a simple, very uh, quick call to action. So if you are interested in joining uh, the innovation community for Pixel as well as OIP, please do just uh, scan the barcode wherever you are physically here or also on Zoom. And then, uh, yeah, uh, hope that you guys can come for more events uh, at Pixel as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kaiser. Thank you to our director of the OIP program as well as the uh, IMDA Pixel Innovation Space. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. And as we are coming towards the end of the event, actually, leading up to the tour of the Pixel Space, uh, we're going to explore the innovation capabilities that you can leverage on over here. We sincerely thank you for your time. And before that, um, before we go on to the tour portion, I just want to say a goodbye to our friends on Zoom since you'll be joining for a virtual tour. But we do hope that you can come down someday to take a look at the capabilities over here uh, and to see how you can leverage on that to take part in more of the OIP challenges over here. So thank you so much to our virtual audience. And just to let you know, I do understand that some of our participants did um, experience some sort of connectivity issue. Do not worry, this entire recording will actually be uploaded to YouTube. Uh, similarly for our live audiences, if you'd like to replay that. Yeah, so um, that will be out of YouTube. So no problems on that as well. Thank you so much to our virtual audience and for the wonderful questions that we didn't manage to answer. Do not worry will be added to the forum. So all you need to do is to go to openinnovation.sg and take a look at the collated questions and answers over there. I'm sure Mandai Wildlife Group will assist to answer some of the queries over here as well. So once again, thank you so much for coming over here. And I do hope that, um, you know, this is an open innovation platform called number 13, which means that we have had many, many successful runs. And as you can see, um, many of the top companies in the world actually leverage on OIP um, to make shocking discoveries for themselves that, you know, a lot of innovation can be done 
when viewed from a different perspectives of our problem solvers, and they would like to leverage on that. So um, our call to our problem solvers is to enlarge the community to invite our friends all along to do this together, because alone it can be difficult, but we gather like-minded people uh, with similar passions, and but with different skill sets, things can be done. And the prize monies are not the final goal. It is actually the beginning of your relationship with a particular company, institution, uh, of an ensuing relationship to develop something. And we do know of many different participating problem solvers which eventually manage to commercialize their products for other industries or other players in the industries. So that can also be further discussed with the company um, in engagement as well. So ladies and gentlemen, for our friends over here, before um, we send you off on the tour, I'd just like to um, give a brief overview on what the Pixar Innovation space is about. So it actually provides the startups and corporates with 28,000 square feet of innovation space and with a unique blend 